Amazing. We just speak more, more encounters for you today, sweet woman. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. She's great. I love her. We love her. Um, amazing. You guys, let's just give the Lord a big thank you. A mighty praise. I'm not like Pentecostal. Pentecostal. But thank you, Holy Spirit. Well, I'm going to invite Ben up, and he's going to introduce our next speaker, our wonderful Liz Wright. Yay! Oh, Hannah. Good morning. Oh. Doesn't she have, like, the Catherine Kuhlman flow oh look God. tonight, today, <laughs> float across the stage? I'll be, I'll be levitating. <laughs> Actually, there was a point yesterday where I was like, I feel so light that if I were to lift off the ground, <laughs> this is when it's going to be. <laughs> is the Bill jo- yeah, I need to pull a Bill Johnson. And, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, how do I even introduce Liz Wright? I don't know. How many of you are familiar Amazing. That's actually so a good cross section. That's not. And then, how many are in her international mentoring community? Yes, with a lot of excitement. I mean, I know. Yeah, she's. They're like yes and waving because the testimonies that come out of her mentoring community. It's a Facebook group, and it also is online through her website, where you'll begin to see. I mean, immediately once you see Liz, you'll see the radiance of Jesus pouring through her. (laughs) I mean, like Eric and I say, and and. Brian Guerin, like, the minute you meet her, there is physical evidence of her relationship with Jesus because of the glow. (laughs) You know, like, there is a radiance that comes from abiding with Christ that pours through her. And I'm not sure if she'll share her testimony. If not, it's readily available through her podcast, um, Live Your Best Life, and uh, shared through her community, too, of just, she came into the kingdom with a physical encounter with Jesus. And that never stopped. That's always been her relationship. That's all she knew, and she's abided in that. And what's beautiful is many of us have that first initial encounter and introduction with God, but then we kind of get off, and then we begin doing things and uh, finding a way to, like, perfect ourselves and our own works, kind of, where she just immediately in the beginning knew, that's not going to (laughs) work. And because there was life in this, that she's been able to stay in that lane, and you can see... Even I've even seen more growth, which is, I don't know how that's possible, in the past two or three years. One, just through her ministry, of course, but that's just because of the backlog of her intimacy with him that he's just chosen to unveil her in this moment that we have the opportunity to commune and come to the table together and feast of the lamb, like a very rich, nutritious, (laughs) but never satisfied, but satisfied, (laughs) Um, you know, calling into him more. So... Anyway, it's an immense honor to get to introduce Liz Wright. I met her about the same time as Hannah. It actually was through Liz that we she came to minister to um, a leader friend of hers. And I had met Liz. So we started Magnify like February 2018. Uh, Eric was our first meeting. Katie was our second meeting. And our third meeting then was with Hannah, Liz, Eric, Brian. And what's fun is that we can see this beautiful, like, commingling of the history now coming together. It feels like, actually, we're picking up from that last meeting in 2018 with the three of them because the history of what it meant for each one of them, specifically in my life, is um, coming to, like, a finishing here. And I can feel, like, what Hannah was prophesying yesterday about 2022, this is the beginning. Like, I feel like after that meeting till now, there's been so much refinement and community's been built, and we've discovered safety amongst once each other that's really sacred and special (laughs) that everyone seems to be able to admit to and be able to realize immediately that I was telling Eric this morning, I'm like, I'm not doing anything specifically. It's just happening on its own, but I know it's through what we forged together in relationship because I needed it, so we want to create a space for that ourselves. But So Liz has grown immensely. It's been great to be on the journey with her, too, and help her set up some of um, her resources. And uh, I really encourage you to join her international mentoring community. Registration just closed. I think it's open about quarterly. But um, what's great is that you hear so many comments about how, I've never seen Jesus. It seems like everyone around me has these encounters with God, but I just don't seem to be able to. And what's good is that there's people in the community that are still that way but they're going through a refinement that is giving them that ability to just relinquish 
the things that were obstructing you know, that warmth of presence. And also just realizing the small, tiny, finite things are the physical evidence of him present amongst us. Like, you know, oh, I feel a warmth on my right side. That, that's more than, <laughs> you know, what anyone on the street's feeling. And that you have the awareness and knowledge where it's from, you know. And so once you pay attention and turn aside to it, there's more access. Like when Moses turned to the bush, the encounter happens. He didn't just pass by. So this morning, yield to what you feel, the small, subtle, like, nudges and glimpses or flash of light or a little pinprick of blue light and just go, I see you, I recognize it, I honor it, and I believe and know by faith that this is you, God, and it's enough for me. Like Madame Guion, I think the biggest uh, lesson we've learned, and I know Hannah, or all of us would say the same thing, is it's in the front of one of her books of intimacy uh, with Jesus Christ is going to him but not having any agenda and not expecting to receive anything necessarily, but being in his presence to minister unto him. And then you never leave unsatisfied. If he were to never encounter you again for 10 years, it is still worth being with the one who fashioned us. Because we're really ministering back to his love that he's apportioned to us, his, his death, burial, and resurrection, all that it costs. Why do we even believe that we deserve to have him come? We absolutely do, and he does. But it's just putting our heart in the right place of, I actually have all my needs fulfilled, and it is finished. So then what am I even really here for but just the pleasure of you? So I think Liz today is going to take us into more of that relaxation, that rest. It's on her voice. And I know like one of the first things she'll say is like, close your eyes. Let your spirit open up and receive. <laughs> and so just drink deeply. If you even fall asleep and pass out, it's good. It's peaceful rest. I've found many times when I'm waiting in the spirit, <laughs> you know, like, because the Prince of Peace came in. And most people don't have that. They actually don't even know what that is. People pay a lot of money, like I said, to find that little bit of peace, even for a few minutes. So just, I encourage you, even if you feel it, you're actually actually going into a real encounter with God. You know, um, our heroes, when they trance out, safe word, just meaning like you lose awareness of your physicality to just be present with God. It's a rapturous experience. Um, it often feels like, you're just going out, <laughs> you're resting, and it often just feels like falling asleep. Because when we sleep, um, Justin Abraham talks about this very clearly, it is when we put aside our self-life, and there's room for the Lord now to come in and minister to you where you're not, your agenda isn't forefront, your motivations necessarily aren't forefront, the needs of your body aren't forefront. So then now, we're finding that um, revitalization in the resting season of our sleep night to night where God is coming in and ministering to our physical body. So allow that to happen in your waking hours too by yielding to the rest. Even if it feels like it's pulling you somewhere else, it's pulling you into his realm of presence. I mean, he's the Prince of Peace, <laughs> King of Salem. <laughs> so that is even more evidence that he is with you. So anyway, it's an honor to introduce Liz Wright and... Uh, Oh, we're in for a treat. <laughs> Hi, family. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, my heart. I'm so with you all in the spirit, but I just wish I could be with you all in person right now to be able to give you all the biggest hug and just to be together in the glory because I know I know that it's just been so amazing so far with Jesus' presence and love just pouring out among you all. So, mm, so 2022, I will most definitely, definitely be there in person. But yeah, it's such an honor to be with all of you lovers of Jesus, people, family who are just crazy in love with our beautiful bridegroom king and wanting to go deeper. So I wanted to just share with you all today um, a, an, an experience that I've had very, very recently 
for the bride that has just again wrecked my heart transformed my life and i pray i i, I pray that as i oh i know i know so i'm just in agreement with holy spirit and with jesus heart right now that as i share jesus will speak to you directly and take you into the experience yourself um so I, I, as always, as you, as most of you know, I literally live a life of intimacy with Jesus where I'm like a barometer for the bride of Christ. And I have these beautiful, profound experiences with Jesus that then um, I start to see, you know, as I'm sharing them, people begin to they activate in other people. So be expectant and um, the, I start to see it rippling out across the body of Christ and people begin to awaken into these experiences and many times other friends other prophetic friends are starting to see different facets of the same truth and so I'm sure there'll be a th themes of some of what I'm sharing with you that you will have already started to get in your spirit during this time so I pray that you get totally I feel holy spirit already wow <laughs> totally wrecked as I share and empowered and encouraged to know your immense value and to to the lord's heart how much joy you bring him as you know that, that your heart would discover that truth all over again that you are the absolute apple of his eye the joy of his heart i mean this is the strength of our life right when we know this it enables us to just let go and trust him at a completely different level and to fall in love with jesus all, all over again just seeing how beautiful he is and how the values of his heart are so different to the ways of the world um, in many, many instances. So last week, and those of you who are part of our international mentoring community family will have heard me share some of this story last week. Um, but those of you that haven't, I haven't released this in public until now. And so, wow, Holy Spirit, wow, 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 just receive, receive. I'm going deeper and deeper. I'm actually, as I'm talking to you, I'm going... <laughs> back into connecting into into where I was in heaven so last week I was in a time of worship and I was actually worshiping and praying with our beautiful Susan Wright those of you that know our beloved friend Susan we were just having some time with Jesus together and suddenly the spirit realm just opened wide up to me and I saw this magnificent enormous staircase of light and I began to just walk up the staircase and at the top of the staircase, I saw this enormous door, doorway, set of doorways that I thought was an entrance into the throne room of God in heaven. Enormous, again, light doors that were made of white, brilliant light. And the doors opened and I walked in. Excuse me, I'm going to just keep getting completely wrecked as I'm sharing this. So just receive holy spirit receive the impartation and just listen open your heart wide and listen to jesus speaking to you open your spirit wide and just just let him take you right in right in because this, this is an invitation for all of us to experience this truth of his heart so i walked in to what i thought was a vast throne room of heaven and that i saw jesus standing right in front of me he reached out his hands and as he does and Many times he will just take me in with his hands to himself and he'll put his forehead onto my forehead. He greets me a lot like that, as do others, like the Apostle Paul. When he, Jesus brings him, he puts his forehead on mine. It's beautiful. There's so much love and affirmation that comes and, and then infusion of, of revelation that flows from their spirit into mine. So Jesus came towards me, took my hands. And on the left-hand side of the room, I saw a vast bookcase with living books. And so I was thinking, gosh, am I in the library? That was what was going on inside me. But I'm thinking, I've been in the library in heaven before. Not that there's, you know, just one, I'm sure, but because heaven's vast. And But it didn't look like that. This was just vast. And so I saw these living books just floating through the air and coming towards Jesus and towards other people from the cloud of witnesses that were behind him. And I'll share about in a minute. And they were on the right hand side of the room, too. And I was mostly seeing women at this point. And um, and then Jesus would take hold of the books or the other members of the cloud of witnesses would take hold of the books. And it was their book 
and then Jesus would bring them towards me. And he obviously heard my thoughts, you know, where am I, Lord? And he said to me, you're in the trophy room of heaven. <laughs> Holy, wow, you're in the trophy room of heaven. And then he turned around and just pointed towards, like swept his hand across, pointing, drawing my attention to the other members of the cloud of witnesses that were coming towards me now. The first one being Bathsheba, the wife of David. And then I saw uh, Joanna, and I saw Abigail, and I saw Mary, Jesus's mother, and I saw Priscilla, and I saw Teresa of Avila and Francis Metcalf, Catherine Coleman, Esther, many people. But the first person that came towards me was Bathsheba. I've never seen her before. And she stood holding my hands and I received the book of her life. And Jesus said to me, these are the books containing the heart journey of my people. These are my trophies. You are my trophy, which is why you're here. And then understanding was released to me that every movement of our hearts during our life Oh, this is what is savored by Jesus. He was breathing in the fragrance of our life story. There was nothing recorded in these books. This understanding was flooding me from him as he was communicating heart to heart with me for us. And he said, nothing. When we've fallen short, we've made mistakes in life. It's not recorded in heaven. They're not recorded in the books of our life. Those things are washed by the blood. What's recorded, it's not the, it's not the enormous platforms of fame and the things that we would attribute to being successful as being successful in life, what we aspire to achieving. If we get our given platforms of fame, that's great. They're platforms, right, through which we can influence with the heart and the wisdom of God. But it's not somewhere where we should draw, depend on affirmation for and validation and significance in life, where we have heart needs, needs met by our positions in life as we know we get into trouble. That everything should be a wineskin through which our relationship expression with Jesus, what we know of him, can be expressed through. In what, in however, he shows that, us to do that. And so it wasn't those the expressions of our lives that the world would go oh that's you know that's what we're celebrating from a person's life what we remember them by and what we celebrate but in heaven in the trophy room that Jesus loves to be in to frequent and enjoy his people in it's every movement of your heart in life in those moments where you've just lost the plot and you the stress is overwhelming you know, that sickness that you're struggling with or that you know the unbelief the internal battles with addiction with the marriage breakdown the all the pain the uncertainty the financial pressure in those moments where you go Jesus I don't have any capacity right now to even believe you anymore but yet I will choose to trust you Jesus, in this moment, I'm not going to react in anger. Wow, I just keep feeling his love so strongly pouring into you. Jesus, who do you want to be for me in this moment? Be my love. Be my kindness. Be my joy. In breakthrough, in the midst of this, me feeling overwhelmed with oppression and depression, feeling despair, hopelessness, confusion, the emotional states of heart that we can find ourselves in as we react to circumstances in life where we feel overwhelmed by that witchcraft attack, that demonic torment, the fear, the oppression, all the stuff that's going on in our, our world right now. When in those moments and all the way through your life, when you've had those moments where you've just looked to Jesus in the, in the weakest moments where literally you've, almost felt like this is not even authentic faith expressing from me it's just a little tiny weak turning of our heart to him going 
Jesus, I, I don't believe you, but help my unbelief. Those moments, Jesus, coupled with Jesus, I love you. Wow, Jesus, I adore you. Jesus, you're my light. <laughs> I'm feeling him as you can probably tell. Those moments, family, those moments of worship and adoration, this is what's recorded in the book of your life and right now is in the trophy room of heaven. Right now, Jesus walks among the books of our lives, they're living books, they're living records of those moments of your heart journey. And the Lord said to me, many of the heart journeys, I was very aware, very aware of like the, the, the women I was seeing, like with Bathsheba, Joanna, Abigail, we know little, little moments of their lives, but we don't know the full, the fullness of their heart journey like Jesus does. And so the Lord said to me, many of the unknown heart journeys of my people will now be known. They're not known, they're largely not known on the earth, but they're highly celebrated in heaven for these are my treasures. So just be encouraged. The life that you're living on the inside in the secret place of your heart to heart relationship, your heart posture before the Lord is the most highly acclaimed celebration of who you are in heaven. Your romance with the the king is the most the most important thing of your life it is what will go on forever it's what's held in eternity it's what's valued most it's what moves the heart of jesus so i just encourage you prioritize him know your value don't allow the world's value system to define you don't let the world's value system dictate to you your worth. You are priceless in value. You are the inheritance of Jesus. You have, we have the power to move the heart of Jesus, to bring the heart of Jesus pleasure. <laughs> He's wanting you to do it right now. I can feel it. Many of you right now are being undone by his love again. When we know this, we invest, it encourages us. It's, I'm feeling him right now, igniting fresh love in your heart. Igniting fresh love in your heart. And, and, and an ability to prioritize this. As this is the core strength of your life, as we experience his love, it gives power. It exhilarates our heart, it brings us alive. This is the heart-to-heart the -heart communion, that union that we can live from is the strength of our life. One moment with Jesus as our heart turns towards him with our yes, with our that look of our, of our heart gaze towards Jesus opens up the ability for us to receive bliss, the, the love of Jesus, to move his heart, to kiss his heart, to embrace his heart, to, in, to bring pleasure to his heart and to live like forth and back and forth in the overflow, the overflow. His love, his love. I mean, we can never out love God, right? In our tiny movements of our heart to move towards him in, with our love. He just lavishes our love, his love back on us. And so it goes, we then, we love him because he's loving us. And then it goes back and forth and back and forth. And this cascades the experience of bliss into our heart and awakens us and floods us with fresh faith, fresh purity of heart, fret we are enveloped on the inside, expanded on the inside with the virtue of his nature, with the beauty of who he is, his kindness, 
patience and peace. Just all the different facets of love that he is, of wisdom, of boldness, of authority, of supreme supernatural confidence, of capacity to govern. With one whisper, we release an authoritative word of truth that flows from his heart to ours in this place of divine embrace. And it changes this realm because the king is speaking. You are each oracles. You are oracles of the king and this heart to heart union that he's enabling us to go deeper into now is the place from which we govern. We are learning right now to live continually in the presence, the embrace centered in the person of the Prince of Peace who crushes Satan under our feet, right? The one who is the Prince of Peace is supreme governance in the earth. He is the creator, right? He's the Alpha and Omega we're talking about. Romancing with the King, with the heart of the King of Glory, the King. I know we know this, but he's exploding these truths in us right now. He's setting us into internal, immovable experience of supernatural peace. He's setting us into the center of himself and he is the throne, right? He doesn't sit on a throne, he is the throne. He is government, he is supreme authority. He's put out of this internal place of peace where we're resting in the arms flooded with the person, the Prince of Peace, the attribute of peace that is who he is. which is internal rest, which is wholeness, shalom, right? And also when you look at the Hebrew word shalom, the picture language of the Hebrew, uh, of the Hebrew, it means, that word is, is extraordinary. It's militant, I'm sure many of you know this, it's a militant word and it also means supreme rest, the absence of all turmoil. But that word in the picture language literally means destroying the yoke that attaches to chaos. So when Shabbat, So as the Lord's trophy, as the one that he now lives in, the tabernacle of the Lord, the shining one that you are, He's bringing you right now deeper in the experience, deeper into himself, where you will live from union. You will live from deep rest. You will live from a heart exhilarated by his love, by your love for him, his love for you. And from this place, you will radiate God which is the governmental capacity that we supernaturally operate in. Because when the presence of the one who is peace, who is joy, who is love, who is wisdom, who is patience, who is kindness, who is goodness, right? Galatians 5, is it Galatians 6? Galatians 5, the, the attributes of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit are the, are the attributes of the nature of God. When we live from our union and we're flooded with him, and we're in that internal place of peace, we release the person of Christ out of us. That living person of Christ, the energy that radiates off us, the transforming power that radiates off us, the light that comes off our being, right? John 1, the light shines with the light of the world. We are the trophy, the trophies of Jesus. The, our living relationship, our heart-to-heart -heart communion with him re releases power, releases authentic, transformational, governmental, supreme power in the nations. This, I believe, is how we are going to begin to govern effectively in the spirit at an unprecedented level as we go forward. In, in our lives and in, on into 2022 and beyond. The bride's voice is rising 
and through the sound shape of our words as oracles heart to heart with Jesus as we communicate truth that is flowing from the heart of Jesus. What we're doing with that word is we're releasing in it the intention of Jesus' heart that we've now just heard and it's encapsulated in that word as energetic power. The creative force of the intention of God's heart is moving as power, as dunamis power out through that word, that, that one word that you've just spoken as an overflow of your union with him. This family is bridal governance. This is what Jesus has been speaking to me about, leading me in, teaching me in, and many of us in for many years now. And this is what's accelerating in us now. Through the pressure, we are coming into rest. We are coming into a place where we're going to experience his love for us like never before. And everything that we see in the life of Bathsheba, you know, uh, many scholars believe that um, it was, you may know this, it was Bathsheba that is the, was the actual prophetic author of Proverbs 31 and that her son, King Solomon, actually scribed it. And that it was she, as, as she stood holding my hands, she, what was coming off her was this regal, bridal purity. And Jesus was showing me that she was a message of redemption, that her life, obviously, how she started off with King David was not good, right? Of course, I mean, he had lusted after her he'd seen her bathing as he was walking out on the rooftop of his palace and and her husband Uriah one of his mighty men of course we know the story you know had been was out on the battlefield away from home and David sent his men down and he she was forcibly brought up to the palace where David took sexual advantage of her and she became pregnant and as we know, and then she, he sent her home. He tried to bring Uriah off the battlefield to cover his mess up, to make it look like the baby had been conceived while he'd been at home off duty. That didn't work. And eventually we know that he commissioned Uriah's murder on the field. And then Bathsheba was pregnant. The baby died. She, her husband obviously had been killed. She was devastated. She went through a period of grieving and then David eventually brought her to the palace where he made her his wife. So the beginning of her story was horrendous, extremely difficult circumstances. We just see a snapshot of her life recorded in the scriptures, really. And then what we see moving forward is that she could have become a very embittered woman. But what we see is that she developed into becoming a very God-fearing, pious regal queen she became wise counsel to her husband david the king and she became wise counsel to her son who ultimately became king of israel so she became a very loyal wife and she became a, a very powerful mother whose influence is recorded right in proverbs 3 where david mentions how, how he had been sorry uh, solomon mentioned how he had been brought up uh, and influenced hugely by the wisdom of his father and his mother and so obviously she was a huge influence in his life and then we see you know later on in the scriptures how when she used to visit Solomon in, the, in his throne room when he was conducting the affairs of Israel as king. He had a throne brought next to, to his own on his right hand side where his mum used to sit and give counsel to him. And when she would come in, scripture records, he would bow down reverentially in honour and respect towards her of his mum and really receive her counsel. And she had huge, huge, huge influence. And so, of course, many scholars believe that we get an insight into her character. And of course, Proverbs 30, what she is, 
what they believe, I believe it too. She is the Proverbs 31 woman. So she transformed. She's a picture of redemption of the bride. Like many of us, the Lord finds us in, in the ash heap of our life. For many of us, our lives have been devastated and Jesus comes in and he brings us on a transformational heart journey, ultimately to become the bride of Christ, absolutely flooded with, clothed with his nature and able to co-reign with him. Well, that's our destiny, right, family? We ultimately, human history wraps up with a bride that's been fully made ready to be the counterpart of God forever. That is our ultimate destiny. So the wisest thing we can do right now is invest in our, and always, and the greatest joy we can ever experience is investing in our relationship with Jesus, loving the heart of the King. And just remember that as you're doing that, this is all being recorded. Like I said, every movement of your heart towards him, every moment that you choose him, no matter how weak those moments might feel to you, it's the story of your heart that's recorded. And I knew, as I knew as I was being reminded in heaven by Jesus of Bathsheba's story, that him telling me that she is a story of redemption. She is very much a picture of the bride, her uh, her poetic, prophetic writing that Solomon scribed in Proverbs 31 shows us what she was seeing. Obviously, it's a very deep, rich revelation that's contained within Proverbs 31. But she was speaking of something of the journey of the heart that she'd gone through and what God had done in her life. And then looking forward to, uh, prophetically to to who we now are in Christ, that we are regal monarchs, that heart journey before the king where our hearts are submitted to him as our head, as the creator, where we live in the reverential awe of God and the love of God. What pours into our lives is transforming power and we move and wisdom and we move from being utterly devastated, to being royalty, literally royalty, to steward, to govern, to walk alongside our king forever, to overflow with revelation and authority. And right now, Holy Spirit, wow, <laughs> right now there's an acceleration happening as he's making us ready for the culmination of the ages. And obviously there's a lot to do in this realm as he brings his kingdom here and he begins to transform the nations like, and activate the word of God in, in Psalm 2, which is that the nations are his inheritance, right? The kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God. The earth is his, it always has been, always will be. And he's trusted the stewardship of it to his people and he's just getting us in position internally in our hearts and in our lives now ready to flip everything to change everything to begin to govern and shift the atmospheres of this planet effectively govern the spirit realm and see the invisible the things that we are hearing from god coming visible as we come in agreement with him by faith and release it release the divine intention of his heart into the earth to see everything come into conformity with the counsel of his will according to the word of God that's what it says you know ultimately human history wraps up in accordance with the counsel of his will and he does it with us he's chosen to do it that way with his bride so there's nothing to fear when we get heaven's perspective as we know there is nothing to fear he is holy spirit wow <laughs> He is the king of glory. He's the alpha and the omega. And at the moment, he just, the invitation is, let me set the eyes of your heart upon my face. Let me cause your heart to become so completely secure and fulfilled that the noise of this world will grow dim. The noise of this world the narrative of the world, the noise of the enemy influencing the circumstances of, of the world, uh, it won't impact you in the same way. It won't grip you and overwhelm you and control you and 
is lifting us out right now of that reactionary level where we've been living in horizontal reaction to responding to the circumstances around us. He's bringing, he's tuning us in, bringing us in our sensory awareness to where we are seated with him in heavenly places, the enemy under our feet with the finished work of Golgotha, the victory of Golgotha, so uh, sure for us in our hearts that we're living from there all the time, convinced of the victory, executing his authority, implementing his authority everywhere we go from our heart of rest. Be still, right, and know that I am God. Be still and experience that word means that I am God. So we're living from rest, we're living from inner stillness. So we're really sensitized, we can really hear the voice of God, heart to heart communion. We really sensitize like never before to the to the dispensing of his spirit, that fresh grace, that fresh faith, that fresh love, that fresh virtue, just expanding within as the light of the world shining through us right? Every day, in every moment, so that we become the influence. So the last thing I wanted to share with you from that experience was um, Jesus had me sit down, and Susan was also there, sat down, and Bathsheba was still holding my hand, and she felt very much like my mom, and the women that were coming around were um, I knew their, star their stories, their, their unknown stories were going to begin to be known, that many of us would receive experiences from the cloud of witnesses, many of their heart journeys were going to be opened up to us to strengthen us and empower us like the influence of older family members who've just lived beautiful lives in Jesus and are full of rich treasure and experience of who he is, that this gift of the wisdom and the beauty of their lives were going to be opened up. And many of the lives of people in the earth that are unknown, don't have platforms of influence, but have beautiful, beautiful heart journeys with Jesus. These stories that are massively celebrated in heaven, these are the trophies of God, are going to start to be known and valued and celebrated and revealed to us to teach us and to strengthen us and to change the way we see what's important and being lined up in that regard of what actually matters to the king so we start to value people in the same way we begin to be able to see through the eyes of jesus heart the value of people that we would perhaps overlook but to jesus you know that precious lady that's like 95 years old perhaps who's sitting at home and doesn't isn't particularly able to walk you know, out of her house very easily anymore. And she just sits in her rocking chair and she just does her knitting and she's making clothes for the grandchildren or whatever, you know, whatever. But nobody really sees very much of her. But our heart is so celebrated in heaven because the movements of our heart are just before the king. These are the stories and she knows him so intimately. She knows him. She knows the expression of his face, you know. She knows the king highly valued, highly celebrated in heaven. We're going to begin to love and value people like that. So the last thing, the men began to come around. We were sitting down. There was an impartation. The women came around us. There was impartation from the beauty of their lives, a strengthening, a teaching that was happening, an influence. Then the men began to come around, and I saw Abraham, and I saw Isaac, and I saw Jacob. I saw the Apostle John, and I saw Paul, and I saw Peter, and many others and more recent ones. I saw Papa Hagen, Kenneth Hagen, and others, um, John G. Lake, and there were many, many that came around. Men became, came behind us as fathers and brothers and closed rank, and I felt them lending their strength. I felt the protection and the strength of the men coming around the women, and the Lord said to me, the women's voice the women's voice is going to be released now and it's going to release healing in the nations, the gentleness, the attributes of God's nature that are held within w women. And the men lending their strength, they're coming in position alongside. And then this, I could feel this immense unity, incredible unity between us, men and women relating rightly, really valuing each other, really lending our strength one to the other. Nobody threatened by the other, nobody misunderstanding each other. There was no competition or even between the women or the men to the men, there was just love. And we closed rank 
And as we closed rank, the voice, the sound that came out of us as men and women together united in Christ. Now the women having found their voice fully and taken their position, there was this pure sound and expression from our lives that looked like Jesus. And it was the bride's voice being released. And I knew Jesus infused the knowledge straight into my heart. The bride that looks like Jesus, the bride that radiates Christ, that go, that, that, that from her life is an overflow of healing, transforming power, delivering power everywhere we go. We're saturating every situation and atmosphere with goodness. We're binding up the demonic just by our very presence because the king is radiating out of us. When we start to operate like this, which is the sound that's coming out of us now, we will become the influence in the nations. So that's what's coming next. We will become the influence in the nations, the bride's voice. It's not religion. It's not rules. It's not telling people you know, 50 ways to enlightenment or how you do it. it, you know, it's not rules. It's the life of Jesus. It's Christ continuing his ministry in the earth through his body as we release him from this deep place of our hearts becoming so secure in the knowledge, the experience of his love, so free to love him, so entwined in the experience of our oneness, living from the strength of our oneness. It is the oneness, as I've said before, and many of you all have heard me say this, it's the oneness that enables encounters. It's not encounters that enable oneness. We're already in union. We're just deepening and in, in, in the awakening of our experience of what's already real. We're going incrementally from glory to glory as our hearts are awakening to the truth of who, who we already are, who Jesus already is, and who we are as his bride. He's enabling us to experience this. And so it's from this place as we prioritize the secret place right now, it is the wisest thing we can do. It is what we, we here we invest into eternity. We invest into the the most important relationship of our life. We invest into the heart of God. We invest into ourselves, into our into our true eternal marriage relationship. And then from that place, power, transforming power will cascade into our lives. Every need in our lives will be met through the riches of his glory in of who he is. He meets our every need, right? He's causing us, he's giving us the desire of our heart to be a people that are utterly in love with him and free to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, where we're so consumed with him. Fear doesn't even remotely touch our lives, even remotely. In this season, we are coming free, family free from all of the attack of the evil one. Fears had its day, unbeliefs had its day. These spirits that have come over the body of Christ trying to blind the eyes of our heart to the truth of who we are and causing us to become impotent. These assignments are broken. They're exposed. Jesus is dealing with all of it. He's removing within us every area where the enemy's been able to get a foothold in was defeated and now the victory of Golgotha is being established in the midst of this. Okay. So the, the men, so we need you brothers, we need you, I just want to speak to the men, I release you, I am in agreement with heaven, I say on behalf of women, we need you to take your position right now alongside us, behind us, close rank around the women that you know in the Lord's heart are voices to rise in this hour. Stand around us, celebrate us, lend your strength to us, come into position. We honor you and we value you and we need you. And heaven is mobilizing you right now. And as you close rank, we will gain our voice. And then together, the sound that will come out of our lives united will 
be an impenetrable sound that will begin to influence the nations and shift this world. Shift this world and bring it, the nations of the Lord's inheritance, bring it all under the headship of Jesus because that's the way that Jesus has ordained it to be, right? He's delegated authority to his people, to his bride in this realm. And then we bring it back under his headship out of our relationship with him. Thank you, Jesus. So I just pray that you will experience him as you go into worship now and you just spend time with him. Just remember that this moment, that right now, as your heart is listening to me and looking at Jesus, and as you just fully focus on him as you go into adoring worship now, you are moving the heart of the king. And he is breathing in the fragrance of your love and it's recorded in the book of your life forever you are his trophy you are his trophy you have value beyond comprehension and when our hearts exhilarated in that truth we become transformed and then we become messages of contagious hope and vessels of glory and transforming power to the ends of the earth. And above all of it, our hearts awaken and it brings Jesus great joy when our hearts are confident in his love for us. And then all that happens is we respond back with even deeper love and gratitude and thankfulness and celebration. We just become obsessed, <laughs> as many of us are, obsessed and utterly in love with the King. This is it. This is the journey now, guys. This is the journey to ultimately, however long we've got, we don't know when he's going to wrap up human history in this expression of it. But this is it. I know for the rest of my life, I, I, I don't know. I, mean, I believe in that we're also in a generation where we're not going to see death. Many of us are going to be like Enoch and just slip through the realms. <laughs> That's a whole other area of revelation that I'm passionate about. I do want to see the fullness of redemption happening and manifesting in our lifetime. And I believe for that. But, um, but regardless, whether Jesus comes back in fullness before or whether any of us go into heaven uh, through the, the doorway of death, um, either way, we are being made ready for that moment now. We're being made ready. And the destiny in front of us, the Lord has said to me, the future is bright because we co-create it together. So don't listen to the news feeds. Don't listen to the narrative of the world. Of course, the enemy can't speak truth. Of course, people that are not walking deeply with Jesus, they can't express truth. Listen to Jesus. Get your read of reality from heaven. Recenter yourself back. What I've shared today is heaven's perspective. I encourage you as you go into worship now, just listen with your heart. Let Jesus completely immerse you. Set your heart on fire again and reframe you back up with heaven's perspective so that you can walk powerfully forward. And I know, I know I've seen Jesus you know, even praying with with our precious Ben, I saw Jesus walking into the building at the beginning of this event, and, and it, I saw the hoopa erected over the building. So it's such a time of deep and powerful intimacy with Jesus that will transform your life. So I pray now as you go into worship that you, you're wrecked, just wrecked, that you go into like even more, more deeper encounter with him than you ever have and that you will never ever ever be the same again <laughs> i can feel it i can feel his invitation i literally feel him reaching out his hands and drawing you into himself drawing you into the trophy room <sighs> to be commissioned to be poured into by those in the cloud of witnesses that have gone before us that have walked as his bride and are his bride now in the fullness of that experience in heaven. Your life is his treasure. You are his treasure. Your heart journey is, is the most important thing to him. Your heart is his inheritance and you are going to know that like you've never known it before. And 
know him in the way your heart yearns to know him. It's time. It's time. So, love you guys so, so much. I'm going to leave you now. Have the most beautiful, beautiful time of worship and adoration. And I know as you go through the day, and our beloved Eric speaks, and Katie speaks, and Richard speaks, and then Ben and Hannah and on, and Jackie's leading worship. You're just all, you're just going to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into life transforming experiences. It's all about the King. It's all about the King. So, love you guys so, so much. Love you so, so much. And I just bless you bless you have the most amazing time and i will see you in person in 2022just say his name. Start saying all the names of the I am. The Yod, Hev, Av, Adonai, Elohim. Yesu, Yeshua, Tamra, Ketiesto. We've stepped into a holy invitation of I just invite you to respond how it feels most fit to you. If it means coming up to the front, um, if it means laying out, you have complete freedom. We're going to step into uh, being wed into Jesus. The evidence that you've seen of Liz's union with Christ as a manifest reality and what I've tasted, the other leaders have tasted and living continually, it's through the bridal union with the one. You know, it all ends in a wedding. It's, a, it's true intercession for the spirit and the bride to say, come. And it's a picture of what ministry unto the Lord looks like is to pray for Jesus. That's been the invitation over Magnify has been praying for him, that there would be a remnant and a bride that would come together, carrying his heart in such a way that it isn't the way of prayer of old where we believe through discernment what we saw was how things should be and thereby praying those things through decrees of what must be true, right, and is good, that now we are seeing from the spirit of understanding that it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I had a vision so clear about um, right when COVID set in of standing in the no man's land between two sides fighting a civil war. One side was blue coats, one side was red coats. Both sides believed as I stood in the middle of their battle line of them facing each other with their infantries. <laughs> um, each side believed that I belonged to them. One side is good and one is evil. And if you're from the side of good, you believe you're good and they're evil. If you're from the other side of evil, you think you're good and they're evil. And who is the one who is judicating which is which? <laughs> which is man's belief in what war they're to fight. And it's from their knowledge, from a tree that was partaken of, that brought forth a separation and fall from grace to leave our first estate and try and wipe away our knowledge of our inheritance and our rest and this peace and union that we used to live in. That in this battle line, may each one sure believe that I belong to them, but that as I walk through it, none touches me because they all think I'm the good guy. <laughs> they think we're the good guy. They don't know to fight us. And instead, they're fighting a war let's say east to west, and I was walking from south to north to Mount Zion. They're not even going the right direction. They're fighting over knowledge that was taken from a tree that brought forth death. Because we're not feeding from that source anymore, our eyes have opened to the original reality of Eden 
and the kingdom of God that Abraham saw by faith. He could only see it by spirit and by truth and his union as a priest unto God when there were no other men that loved him the way that Abraham did. So Lord, we no longer partake in good or evil, but into the ways of God, the one way of God, the man the way. And this is only known through bridal union. When he takes the ring of the Holy Spirit and slips it on your finger and says that this is the surety, the mark, and guarantee of the future inheritance of what is to come that was purchased through the blood of Jesus. So clearly, I had uh, my first bridal encounter was just that. Taken into prayer, not fitting in the environment that I was in, feeling, becoming completely overtaken by the Holy Spirit, and knowing that what was in me probably wasn't permissible in that space, because you could feel it. Instead, what it did was it came and enveloped into me and out of me, and I saw clear as day before I was really seeing anything, a living, basically, hoop of light around my being. And I, I knew this is the Holy Spirit. And I knew the Lord gave me the interpretation up from that scripture of the future inheritance of what is to come, that surety, that gift. Another translation says that that is the ring. It's God's promise slipped onto you of who he is and who we are to be. What's been beautiful about these meetings is that this has become the space for individuals and they have even physical evidence of being given rings. <laughs> they come into this fashioned union where you need to see Christ for yourself come and that habitation by the Holy Spirit encircle you and envelop you and the ring wasn't just worn around my finger, it was worn around my body. He is wedding the body, our body, and us as one. So come, Lord Jesus. So we are coming into the sacred invitation so that you too can come into this union because it's only one in co-crucifixion uh, with Christ. To live his life with him, that's what you're agreeing to. It's the gospel, actually. It's the hidden gospel that isn't obviously always evident when you say yes to Christ. This is what you said yes to, is to live a life with him. But that life that you're living with him is actually being taken into his earth walk. And not just his earth walk, but the conception before the birth of this earth, before creation when he was co-crucified with us, before the foundations of anything being created, before the plan was even began to be wrought into the earth. At this meeting, I actually, it was the first time that I realized we were co-crucified then. I keep thinking of Calvary, <laughs> but to realize it was from the beginning, I was hanging on a cross with you from the beginning. The Father spoke the words that created and fashioned this earth, looking at his son already hanging on the tree and us in him. <laughs> so I just invite you again, if this is actually an altar call to go into this place, because no longer is it you just living a life in this earth walk, whether it's an immortal walk, <laughs> whether it's for five years, a hundred years, whatever it's gonna look like, you're deciding actually to live the life of Christ Jesus. You're gonna go back when he was baptized and be baptized with him. Like what I shared last night of going into the wilderness with him, I chose to live that life with him. He did none of it apart from us. We have always been in union and he is the one new man he is all, all things were created through him and in him and for him, and that includes us. So Jesus, we come to the mountain of suffering love, like you said in Song of Songs. This Shulamite bride who has been tossing and turning in her travail of love from having been wooed by the bridegroom, even though dark, <laughs> 
from being beaten down by toil and the sun of day, working in the brothers and fathers' vineyards, seeing even foxes run around. Yes, you have that discernment to see what may hurt, but you've tried to catch them yourself, and instead there's been infestations. <sighs> but the Kingsman Redeemer comes on his horse, and he looks down upon us, the ones gleaning from the sides of the field, to nourish ourselves from the little that he's given up to us, that he has allowed even for a bondservant, for a slave to take a portion and eat of manna from the fruits of his garden. So we take, we collect, and we see the ravage of time and the spots of the dark sun <laughs> try and fashion us into its likeness. But he came and he saw me and he knew me and he knew the value of my heart. I kept myself pure and virginal from my conception because there was a promise of one. But my exterior doesn't appear to be that. This world, the influence of my enslavers, a Pharaoh that has made me do the things that I didn't desire to do. Look at me, I have stripes upon my back because I chose justice and truth and purity. But they looked at me in disgust because of it. Why can't you be like them? Why can't you be subjected? Oh, it was because I said yes to a God of the ancient of days without having ever seen his face, but knowing that he's worshiped upon a mountain and in the realm of Jerusalem. Like the woman at the well, where do we go to worship him? And he says, no longer will you have to go to a kingdom or become a pilgrim to cross seas to find him, but instead you will worship him in spirit and in truth. And us too, having said yes to this co-union life with him, we are brought forth to that well and we see the fruitfulness of this other new Shulamite, the one who should have been disqualified because she was a Samaritan, a child of a bondservant through Ishmael, <laughs> whose history, whose legacy was the inheritance being taken away. There's no way to go back and rectify the sin that my forefather made with Hagar. I know the truth of how God really loves the ones that come through Isaac and Jacob. We see the evidence because we can see Jerusalem in the distance, but we've been on the outer walls, though we know that he is our God too. We see a bush too that fires in the desert every so often, and we've heard of waters that are commingled by the finger of God and men step into it and they are healed because he sends forth his ministers. But they don't allow us into the gates of that city because we become dark. We're illegitimized by adultery, by the sin of our forefathers. We know that Israel is wed to God. But what about the Gentile? <laughs> the other day I was taken back uh, in this encounter with the Lord inviting me to pray for uh, the Arab people, the children of uh, Ishmael. And I began to go back and see Abraham, you already repented. You know, the promise still came forth like what Katie was sharing last night, it was still one he was relieved from the trauma of when he tried to self-fulfill a prophecy and their youth was restored and Sarah conceived. So obviously it was rectified already. Then why is there still such pain? Going back, Ishmael, Hagar, they repented too. Why would they not, why would they wanna be separated? 
but God is still their God. He's still the I am. They know him. But then Jesus, I asked, how can they return? There was nothing in the past from old generations that could have fixed these wrongs, but it's through the inheritance of Christ the one. See, they're a picture of us too from the outside. We still serve the God of Abraham, but we haven't seen the face of our God and been giving access to his kingdom and come into Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to join our family that we know belongs to us. It's like being removed from our core. And it was so clear and it's so simple. It's being re-engrafted to the tree of life by Christ himself. And then immediately we see us, the Gentile, even the Jew that's become separated and having said no and seeing Christ as a stain by coming in through the blood of Christ Jesus and having been rent forth from his side and been poured forth and birthed out of him. Abraham is now our father. And we had been seen in the sky as the future inheritance and the promised stars of the generations. Our light didn't go dim. And therefore, for them and for us, Moses becomes our prophet and lawgiver. And Ezekiel is our prophet. And Isaiah has told us who we are as Israel, that we are no longer the harlot. us gleaning from the fields I'm not a harlot and they call me one but Christ came Kingsman Redeemer and he saw my fallen face and fallen state the ravage of time and the trauma of my heart has made me sick It came inexplicably. I have served God, so why am I subject to these things? To be like a Job. Was permission given to try me? And then we see that God has such faith and trust in us like he did his servant. Sure, enemy, try and take him, but instead you will see his abundant love for me. Nothing will separate him from my love. He knew Jesus. Jesus witnessed through space and time to the ones that were from before. So the Shulamite has seen him. This king, the owner of all these lands, the kingdom that I have ever seen or ever known, everything that's been created in this small world that I haven't been able to even travel outside of. He is the owner, he is the heir of all these things, and he would look at me and see this hidden white pure heart of love hidden inside a dark one. My stripes don't turn you away. My disfigurement doesn't make me unqualified for a prince and a king. I don't look like the other beautiful and pure virgins that stand in your courts who've never worked a day in their lives. those other virgins and brides-to-be, now they look at me. And they're the ones asking, but what do you even see in him? Don't they know they've been so close to him their whole lives? That's the body, that's the church. He's bathed them in incense and oils and ravished them with his love, but they've never left those courts of self-indulgence of his gifts. 
They feel as though they've already received everything, but they don't know that their true portion is so much greater. And they're boastful and they're prideful. And when I am married to the King of Kings, you'll all be subject to me and I will be greater than thee. <laughs> and you hear jealousy from the virgins that stand in his courts and say, I heard that his eyes have fallen upon a dark and ugly one in the outer fields. She doesn't even own anything. Her family is nothing. They're sinners and harlots and adulterers. But when Christ looked down upon this Shulamite, he saw the white, the purity, the love, and the fragrance of true ecstasy. He said, this is the one I've been searching for because she truly loves me. Now, when I say she, I'm talking of the bride, the church. This is inclusive of man. This is me. The same way we are sons of God and women have that portion, we too are his bride. Israel, land, a people are the bride of God. So we too individually have come into this union and as we are rectified in this peace, we're able to bond to each other in love and erect a stronger structure, the temple of the living God, not fashioned by the hands of man, but by Christ himself, marked by blood. We are this living sanctuary, and he's been fitting us as we've been honed in the quarries and taken into the space of perfect peace where there isn't even the chisel of a hammer, but there's always perfect quietude and rest where he abides. Now that the Shulamite has begun a relationship with the one that is proposed to her. She tries to make herself ready, but feels as though to fall short. What does she have to enrobe herself with to look more pleasing like the ones that stand in his courts? We try and scrub away the dust of the past, use our own healing salves and concoctions to heal these outer wounds, but they fall short. But I've heard the promises of his healing that he carries with him. Oh, don't you know I just see you for who you are? That I actually fashioned and desired you to be and to walk and even have the existence in a lowly nature as you have. It's you that have come up in humility that really know what I am as a king. Others have fashioned labels of to what I must be like, but it's talk. They've never even met me. What gives them service to? <sighs> so she goes back home and she tosses and travails in her bed of love. I try and return to him, but my feet fall short. I grow weary and tired, though he is my only portion that can possibly satisfy. And when it's too late, I run to the gates and I start running around asking, where did my beloved go? Have you seen him? Yes, I know him, but I can't, I don't know where he went. It's not until the Shulamite says, okay, yes, my love, I will climb the mountain of suffering love with you. I will go to Golgotha. I will go to Calvary. It is in that verse where the key is of the abundant entrance of becoming the wedded bride of Christ. Yes, I will ascend the mountain of suffering love with you. Yes, I will become your bride. And it is after that verse that you see that she becomes the ecstasy of Christ Jesus and his fountain that he drinks from and that all pleasure is fulfilled within her being. So therefore, we stand at the base of this mountain, God. We see the skull of Golgotha and the fear that it tries to hold in front of us. 
but little do we know that the ark is hidden within it for a testimony that's about to come forth. Like Simon, we carry the cross for Jesus. When he says, daily pick up your cross, it was ours together. We ministered to him by anything I can do for you, to relieve you, a man of flesh and blood, us too, in this beginning of union, that we would feel the weight of glory of what he did for us on our behalf to carry his cross but only but a certain distance. Because like with Mary and John, we stand at that height and we see him take the last steps himself, walking and ascending up that hill, eye to eye, to see him disfigured, hurt, broken, scorned, bloody, unrecognizable, bearing a tree upon his back and gently lifts up his gaze from the dirt to look at us and smile. For years, I only understood the suffering of Jesus, <laughs> but never the joy set before him <laughs> that he could carry a cross and supernaturally have enough blood to still have more to pour out on the tree than what he even had when he was whipped and carried this thing. How far? And there's still more blood. And as he walks up this mountain, he makes sure to graze past me so the blood would come. at me with eyes of joy through the height of any pain that man could have to make sure that the imprint of his blood was upon me. As if to say, this is for you. Look what I'm about to do for you. my own life. <laughs> Your suffering has meant all of this. You have been coming into that union of his suffering. <laughs> you weren't crazy. It wasn't because you gave access to the enemy. Like he told me when I got COVID most recently, he said, you didn't do anything. There was no door of access. This is something I'm just bringing you through. <sighs> It's a testimony of the strength of this Enoch company. <laughs> I'm building your faith within you. This didn't kill you. Why would the next thing and the next thing and the next thing? You're becoming living testimonies of light. So in that place of suffering, in my worst depravity, in my bipolar manicness, I turn and face the sun, the living king, in quiet and just speaking his name. And he pulls us forth into a union. You ought to know my union. Die with me. Lay on this tree with me. Feel all I feel with me. Co-intercede with me and carry forth the bride and the heart with me that we can be taken into a rapturous state beyond human capacity to feel what he felt in a longing to be able to cradle the heart of God and somehow nourish it while he's going through the worst of it. That is the true intercessor that stands at the feet of the man on the cross and holds them and weeps and just says, if this nearness ministers to you, if it helps you even just one, that one man knows. I'm with you, I abide for you. 
May these tears give warmth and somehow relieve what must be felt through the holes in this feet. Take me, I would lay on this cross for you. If I could do it for you, I would. So Jesus, we do it for you and with you. Oh, no, oh. oh, and so I'm laid out and I feel I'm in him and we are one and my arm is outstretched to the side and I see that Roman guard reluctantly even disgusted by what he's doing because he even knows the testimony of his strength. He's seen someone that shouldn't even still be living and breathing and Christ looks at him with a face of joy. How could he pierce him? How could he pierce him? How could he pierce him? How? And I feel that nail go through my hands. The nail. How could I feel such a thing and live? But somehow you're taking it. How could I come into the union of this feeling? <laughs> we are co-crucified with you. When we say yes to a life with you, this has to be the doorway. Otherwise, what have you come to? Do you want to be as Christ and like Christ? You have to die with him. Die with him. Die with him. The old man dies with him. And yet no longer do I live, but Christ lives in and through me. I have been lost into this rapturous being. This is the union life. And they lift up this cross and settling down into the dirt, we have fallen and it yanks upon the nails into our flesh, but yet it doesn't hurt anymore. Even our crucifixion doesn't hurt anymore. It is the God man. We look down and see John and Mary weeping and travailing, and they too, as we are, they're joined on that cross. They felt the cross. They were brought into that co-intercession too. It's why John's the only disciple that didn't die of natural cause. He lived this life he lived. Oh, shamate takaskosko. Natural cause or by the hand of man. He's still walking, he's still watching. He's ministering from this apocalypse, the revelation of the God, the one. He's even speaking now who Christ is to be in his returning. That scroll is opening. It was unsealed by the hand and the lamb, the man with the blood. We only can touch it and see that scroll by joining in that blood to understand the language of the promise of heaven. So we join with the utmost prayer of intercession with Christ, where all was accomplished. We look down and see all of creation from the height of this tree upon the skull itself, the mind, knowledge, and psyche that believe that it crucified me. And through the mouth and mind of God, we ask our Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And we've come into such a place of peace in Christ, in death, in pain and torment, that we feel the rest of heart to forgive any man. and see the smallness of any power that would even try and come against him. We already feel victory before a resurrection. How is that possible? And 
we say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This full relinquishment. Christ gave away his soul and spirit unto his Father. And so we must too. Oh. It is finished. Peacefully, restfully, fulfillment of all things, it is finished. We're so few say yes to going. This is part of the key of resurrection. Life is you that are willing to go into the depths of Sheol with me. For years, I still was walking through pain and grief and death, actually sitting in the tomb with Jesus, mourning over his lifeless body, feeling the cold and the death and the loss of promise of what the disciples must have felt. We saw the God man and now he's no longer with us. Are we supposed to do something now? Oh. I had everything when you were alive and now just as I got you, you're gone. You told me of all these beautiful things to come. We dreamt of our future together, and now you're gone. Now I just have to live vicariously in memories of you with others. Remembering what once was as you teach and spoke. What about what is to come? Is it only in an afterlife when I die too, in this natural state that I can finally rejoin you? then I must be grieving to even live this life because of separation from you. My life has become a grief and a torment to me because I'm separated from you. If you're not here on this earth anymore, in this old mortal body that died and laid waste and is locked in a tomb, how could I ever return to you? In fact, we feel that with the death of our loved ones is the picture of Christ in them that is now lost and forgotten and separated from. But it wasn't until I said yes in a bold proclamation that Jesus, I will descend into hell with you. If I am to live in a co-union life with him, how could I skip where victory was won? And if I'm with you, it must be the safest place. I'll go to the place I fear the most. What took me into my co-crucifixion experience with him was when I told him, God, I relinquish everything. I have nothing left. And I was in a place in my life where I didn't have things anyway. So it was easy to give him what was left of me. All the potential, all the gifts, all the ways, all the things I believed he told me, I gave them back. And then I told him, the only thing of value left in my life, physical, mortal, spiritual, is my salvation. It's the highest gift, God. If that is something I have to give back to you as a gift to you, I lay it down. Now there's a warning with this. You can't do this more than once because you crucify Christ again. That's a sin. And he doesn't return after that. But that was the greatest possible gift. And actually, reading Madame Guion after that, those exact lines were in there. <laughs> As a ceiling of, this is literally everything. And because I gave him that gift, I'm also taking on the reality of what it means to go into hell with him. 
means I could be left there. I and we descended into the depths of this place, into the river of death with the lifeless body of Christ Jesus. Me weak and feeble too and having lost any vitality and feeling just the cold corpse of me. Taken to the scales where life and death are weighed to see if anything can match the lightness of the feather of truth that descended from the wing of God. Little did they know when they were to judge Christ, he was the only one that could tip the scale, that none was as pure as him. And in that moment, he came forth in life and victory, and they knew that all things now were subject to him. Oh, ah, yes, ah, yes. And he took the keys, and immediately they bowed down. Oh, oh. They remembered him from when they were in their first estate. Their pain and grief, too, of how they've been separated from Christ. <laughs> Even though they felt as though they had victory over him when he died, <gasps> to fall down to their God again that they've been separated from for so long. <laughs> and to feel their smallness and littleness and their eternal damnation sealed of that I will never have him. They killed him to take him back again. That's what made them weak and decrepit because they were separated from him. If we have his lifeless body, then maybe, maybe then it'll be the way it was. It never will be. <laughs> they bowed down to him in jail. <laughs> and he made a spectacle of him. He even called Lucifer by his name, reminding him who he was and who he was supposed to be. The name that isn't used to describe him anymore in his own kingdom, he used the name that he gave him. The pain of that, <laughs> weeping. So often when I see uh, people delivered in my own life in deliverance, when those principalities, when those demons leave your body, they're often weeping um, because they're separated from the light in you that's God that they desire to be restored to again. That's why they cling to you. It takes strength from having been a bride to have the fortitude to say, no, I don't have sympathy for you. You can go out the door and leave. But those that carry sympathy, give him that access to remain so that you believe in you have a heart of mercy are ministering to a false and demonic spirit. You need to stop it. <laughs> uh, do not wipe the tears from their eyes. Um, I've seen it so clearly this weekend. Uh, these things leaving us and just weeping because <laughs> they knew him and they had him when they were with you. That is not your job as a prayer and intercessor. That is what has deceived the church for too long. Do not give in to that sin. You're entertaining demons at your table. Christ himself overcame Lucifer. Instead, we look at him and call him by his name too. I've been finding myself in prayer. He's not Satan, he's Lucifer. Because it just makes him even feel more wretched because he knows who he was to be. And he knows you know who he was supposed to be. He runs from that name. We watch the gates of paradise open and the family of God return to Christ, saying, I won, it was finished. And all of them bowed down before the King of Kings, see the ones that they tried to ensnare, Abraham, John the Baptist, their recent trophy. He actually has them walk over their bended backs as they're bowed down. <laughs> They all walked out in a procession over the bended backs of these things that were their captors. 
And so we too, he takes us over this bridge of triumph to walk over the back of the enemy. Like he said, the bride <laughs> would step over that serpent. This is it. The serpent's defeated. He's lifeless. The rattle of the tail doesn't even put fear into us anymore. We already experienced his death. And it was, I'm laying on this body grieving of separation. I feel the first heartbeat. And I watch a transfiguration take place from beneath these robes as if it were his cocoon. This old mortal flesh made into the new creation and the new man with the body of God. Where he was just one, he's now made into all with us encapsulated into him and he being the triumphant, victorious one. Clear as day, we have this resurrection experience. Nothing of ourselves could wake us up, only him. And the stone is rolled away by his company, his family, his ministers of the gospel. And as we proceed and see this light of the new day sun, the walls of this crypt were our Babylon and now we step into the promised kingdom of our God. And through this door, we see the ones that have already walked through the veil, that are alive today and continue to live through their death. We're joined with the family of God, the firstborn registered in heaven. And then we look down and see I was always living. I really didn't taste death, he tasted it for me. In my heart, you let me experience it with you, but I died in you and you did it, I didn't do it. Even when those nails went through my hands, I felt it, but it wasn't my flesh. I don't even need to carry around a stigmata, it's your testimony. Looking at you is my testimony that I speak of. I don't need to look at it upon my own flesh and have my own stripes. Your fashion, the bride is without spot or wrinkle. Jesus had a perfect complexion and we look like him. Radiating like the sun, because now we've seen the sun risen into its proper place in the sky and drown out all the other lights, like Eric Gilmore says. No longer any star will govern over us, but actually those things will now serve us. The moon was made to help administrate a government of God, and the sun itself too, but as servants unto the creation of God. Ooh, habash, gebede hese. So we have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, We've come through this archway of trust now with the living testimony. Like Katie was saying last night, we've overcome him by the blood of the lamb and our testimony. He's really underlined for me lately, our testimony. I had read it so long as Christ's testimony, but we overcame from our testimony. That's why we have to have the co-intercessory experience with him so that we are co-participants in the victory. <laughs> Overcoming the enemy is now our delight. And it's with such rest and ease because we already went to hell and back. <laughs> Not in like a figurative way, but in an actual mortal and spiritual reality. So now we can come into this rest of, it's been finished. Like I, you heard me say the other uh, last night when I had that like psychic witchcraft attack, and I just went, no, but it's done. I know those things aren't allowed anymore. There's a trust in your heart of where you just know from a renewed mind of Christ, doesn't, it's not allowed anymore. 
so you don't give permission to it to have an effect over you. You're just feeling what he feels. So now you're being given your garments of beauty. You have won. He told me uh, our last meeting, your garments of white were actually now being exchanged for like decorative armor of gold. It's not even really functional to fight with golden armor. It's too malleable and soft. It's really just regalia because we're not having to go out into the battle lines anymore, but we're obviously warriors and it's a testimony of who we are. Just burnished, untarnished, it doesn't even get touched by anything. It gets polished instead by the hand of the Father in love. This is our strength, they're gonna see us this way. So Jesus, we see that ring set upon our finger and not only the promise but as Liz was saying, the hopa has been set up over this place. And actually, uh, when we prayed, I, we, yesterday morning, I believe, or the day before, pulled up here and Liz and I were praying together and she saw the building. She started describing it in the spirit. She's like, it has a flat roof. There's land surrounding it. I see Jesus walking through these open doors. And she's like, and I see the hopa set up. And Christ is walking in through the door down the aisle as the bridegroom king. He's dressed as... Um, like an Israeli priest uh, groom. And I see, she saw Mary and the ladies from um, the marriage at Cana preparing the bread and kneading it together the same way they did then for the feast together. And then they started laying out the fruits and the figs so that we would be nourished because we just went through something. <laughs> we need to be filled up again and begin to taste the delights of his goodness with him. So Jesus is coming to seal the deal now. <laughs> Not just a proposal, but union now. Where he says, you will become flesh of my flesh. That marriage covenant that we would be one body we become the flesh, the living flesh of the actual physical body of Christ that has been taken into heaven. He desires the flesh of his flesh. He desires to marry your flesh that is fashioned and is holy and been made purified. Your flesh is holy. Not the sin corpse thing we unzipped yesterday of pride. <laughs> your flesh that he fashioned from the beginning. Like he told me, he gave me a glimpse of walking with Enoch and it didn't look like this, how we would pack, uh, picture this like rapturous, ecstatic, floating around type of thing. It was this. It was fellowship, eating, living a natural life, because that's how he fashioned us to reign in the garden was to just walk with us like this. This is a created reality to host heaven <laughs> and experience God how he desires to be experienced. Flesh to flesh. Flesh to flesh. <laughs> so we're just gonna lean in. And I know you've already had this encounter, but just say, I marry the one. And there's just one. <laughs> so Lord, now we go through this archway of trust. And with this wedding song, we sing our song of victory, like the victory song of Moses, of our king triumphant victor that drowned every enemy. <sighs> and we carry this ark in procession of joyful praise because of our testimony. We follow Moses up the mountain, and every time he says holy, the revelation of all that he'd seen in heaven and on earth, is imparted into us and we step one step higher. And we follow the man that went up the mountain of God and he says, holy. And the revelation of the goodness of God and how he was experienced at the breaking of the waters, the stone is imparted to us. And he walks up higher and says, holy. And then now we're with the creatures and the elders forgetting Moses and just he is holy. And that crown that we have seen that he set upon our heads, 
We don't even desire it anymore. We even throw it down to the ground, even though it was his perfect gift. We can't even wear it because we're so lost in rapturous love. But they just fall down. Because how could this gravity even keep it on our heads when we're prostrate on our faces? Weeping and singing holy with the four living creatures. We ask with holy gratitude. thousands of years, every nation will see this testimony.
Fill them up, yes, no lack, more, 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 gabababashiki. <laughs> this is the abundant life now. <laughs> this isn't the old way anymore. <laughs> Seek the Baba. Seek <laughs> the Baba, hey. Yeah, feel the whirlwinds of grace ripping through this place. Woo! Whirlwinds upon whirlwinds in this house, Jesus. Woo! Alalai, kedede. Yay! <laughs> Your sound brings agreement and more power to the winds. Woo! Shadai, kedede, rabade. Oh, yabash, tere, daras. 
detrás. Wow. The dove of peace resting upon us, that which he's familiar to, this branch from the vine. This dove now resting on this known branch that's wed to his king. Hmm. If we're going to stay in this, we're actually not really transitioning, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to share a dream I had actually at the end of our last meeting with Eric Gilmore was um, I was attending this wedding at this beautiful Beaux-Arts style hotel and uh, there were tents built within tents. They actually had form and structure that um, were encapsulated by the canvas. So like columnar structures and um, it reminds me of some of Frank Gehry's work that he has at the Disney Concert Hall from the columnar structure, architecture background. And uh, so, but it, what was beautiful is that it was tents within tents of meeting. And I had an encounter actually at that, at Eric's uh, School of His Presence of the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel now encircling around us. They all came with their golden censers where the fire fell as Moses's um, gift was dispersed to the 12 tribes. And it was a reconciliation of what happened today of the old covenant and the new covenant rejoining with our family of Israel. We've been trying to just live off of the apostolic revelation and not the tribal revelation of our forebears because they're a picture of the breadth of the kingdom of God that was institutionalized and was never to really be dissipated. The law dissipated, but not their function and their role. So if you want to be a Levite, you have to be joined to your tribe of the Levite priesthood. It doesn't just come through understanding the gospel of one of the apostles. It's having all in all. And so the 12 tribes of Israel are encircled around us because we've come to the same tent of meeting that we have access to. And so we're being restored into the full church. You know, 24 elders, two tribes of 12, a finished covenant together. We were only living out of the new covenant and not the fullness of the gospel. And in this uh, uh, tent within tents at this wedding, I saw the wedding planner getting everything ready, beautiful floral bouquets. And I turned to her and I said, you know, this is what I want it to look like at our meetings. I want to just like have beautiful, ornate, you know, indulgent gatherings. And she said, well, don't you know that that's what you do? <laughs> She's like, you build the tent, which is who you are, and then you invite in the priest and the speaker, and they are authentically who they are because it's not necessarily my role or function to be the priest in that temple. It's to be, you know, one of the artisans, builds the structure, you know? And then call them in, and then she said, don't you know Richard Gordon is one of those people? <laughs> and I went, well, I know, but I need to know, no. <laughs> When I first saw Richie, oh, I've seen him around for a while, but I went to, I snuck into a Twin View meeting where he leads the services. And I mean, like, if he can sneak in, that's where it's at. <laughs> um, I wept uncontrollably from beginning to end because I just saw the camaraderie and spirit. It's something like when I was talking about Hannah, like I met Hannah, I was like, I know her because it's also myself. Like when I see Eric, I actually, sometimes I, I, it's like, I love him like I love my, myself. Not in like a prideful or selfish way. It's like, it, he was actually bone of my, like I actually love and cherish him like if it were my own body and life with Christ. And it was the same uh, with Richie. And I also saw the familiarity with like, when I look at him, I actually see Eric's face extremely clearly. <laughs> and then he reminded me of the gifting on um, Lonnie Frisbee's life immediately and I was like oh he's the Jesus people leader that's what it meant to me I was like he he's gonna be the one and is the one that leads the true glory and manifestation of the Jesus people movement and it's so strategic that he's here in California obviously and um, anyway I just love you and honor you Richard you mean the world to me I mean like what little time we spend together it's family 
you know, and I never want to be separated. <laughs> and like Eric said yesterday when we were together, he's like, let's do this when we're 80. Let's do this when we're 250. Like, let's do this. <laughs> so we're living in the millennial kingdom, you know, like we're never going to stop, guy. <laughs> so why don't we all welcome Richard Gordon. Do you want this one? Because I know it's on. Check, check. There we go, the host mic. Hi. You just wanted me to sh share a little testimony of when I was in. Um, so when I did third year with Richard, um, that was back in 2017, 18. Um, the Lord was reminding me yesterday in the morning when Ben was praying, I had the Lord just said, hey, remember the encounter that you had when you were with Richard. And we were in Richard's office and it was 2017, October 2017. And our team is sitting in the office. It's just um, me and then a few of the other girls on the team. And Richard begins to share um, about an encounter that he had being like a handkerchief in the river of God. When you're a handkerchief in a river, you're just going, right? <laughs> you're just flowing on the river. And the minute he started sharing, boom, it was like a whirlwind of the water of heaven came into the office, and this is the little office, and it started swirling and swirling and swirling around, and I got taken up into a heavenly encounter, and I could hear Richard talking, but I went into a, a prominent, probably like one of those marking encounters on my life in our little office, <laughs> and suddenly, the Richard was saying, the Lord is going to take you up a stairwell. And in that stairwell, he's going to give you vision for what's coming. And there's a sense of urgency uh, in what God wants to reveal to you and speak into you. And I remember as he was talking, I was up in this heavenly encounter and I was walking up this stairwell and I came to an outlook. And as I was on the outlook, I just saw Bethel in flashing lights in front of me. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you're going to get hired as a pastor here. This is your next season. And he's, he's continuing to just like lead in counter time. And as I'm looking, he has no idea what I'm seeing, but Richard suddenly goes, Hannah, you've grown in favor with God. And now you're going to grow in favor with man. And the Lord's positioning you to be ready for leadership. And he had no idea what I was seeing and what the Lord was telling me while this encounter was happening. And the next thing I know, an angel is in front of me and it had a branding on it, like a, like a cow branding. <laughs> legit like with fire hot fire I'm like that's about to touch me that's gonna hurt <laughs> but I'm gonna go ahead and yield to it and it was as if someone took hot brand and the angel branded my chest and I was branded with this heat and I began weeping I had never had that kind of physical it's like my chest and the heat it was so literal this was not imaginary this was literally this heat was going into my chest and I went into a significant encounter of being the bride of Christ where Jesus came to me holding a rib 
And he said, Hannah, you're my missing rib in the same way that Eve was made out of Adam. The body of Christ is made from my side where my blood and my water poured out at my ribs. Will you be my bride and will you raise up the bride of Christ for me? I remember I was out for probably like an hour in that office. <laughs> but <laughs> I was. I think he was gone by that point. But when I came out of that encounter, it was one of the most significant mark. I'm walking in that now. This happened in 2017, and I'm walking in the ministry and calling all my life uh, because of what this man carries and opened up. Um, in his intimacy with Jesus and in this realm of encounter with God. Um, so I'm so grateful <laughs> for you, Rich. Thank you. <laughs> oh, something else. Uh -huh. What was significant about that too is the Lord told me about a five-year period what was going to begin to happen, and I'm walking in that stuff now from that encounter then. So, Yes. Be ready to get marked today. <laughs> you haven't come for me. You've come for another. You've come for another. You haven't come for me, you've come for another. You're not looking for some man, you're not looking for some leader. You want the Son of Man. You're not looking for a teacher. You're not looking for a teacher. There's already one. You haven't come for me. You've come for another. You don't need a king, because there's ready one seated on the throne. Oh, I feel your hunger. I feel you're sitting in your seats, but I feel you are so hungry. And I feel your pull of like, I've come here for something. It's not found in me. Found in another. And just one touch, just one touch will change the next five years. It's not a lie, it's not high, just one touch will change the next five years. Not a man, not just a man, God, not just a meeting, God, let me meet him. Let me meet him. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Eh? I've got so bored with meetings. I've got so bored with them. Oh, I'm in hundreds of them. Not another. Not another, I don't need a meeting, I need to meet you, hmm. I don't need a teaching, 
I need you. In one moment, I change five years. Five years, my daughter. Oh, I'm so bored with some meetings. Eh? Not this one. This one's great. I'm so bored, eh? Man, I just get, get, will I get feedback if I jump here? Probably not. But I just get so bored, eh? Man. <laughs> Same old format. People walk in, they listen to, this might offend some people, some old white man share some stuff, and, and then they walk out, and life's not changed. I'm like, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just get bored, eh? Oh, just get, I'm like, I haven't come for a meeting. I know you're not here for that either. You haven't, like, driven, driven around. and You haven't come to, like, you haven't come to be like, man, we had a good meeting. A waste of time, I'm telling you. I've had hundreds of those. Hey, Jackie, don't want it. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I like whatever happens. Just, I pray you meet Jesus. You know, like uh, a meeting with a man does nothing, but a meeting with the Son of Man. To Simon, to Peter, to Saul, to Paul. If you meet me, let me tell you. I'm not that great. I'm the ass that brought Jesus in. And the crowds were going wild as Jesus rode in on the ass. They're going wild. They're, wow! And sometimes the ass thinks, wow, I'm pretty cool. They really like me. Look what I'm doing. And they forget I'm just an ass. <laughs> you haven't come for me, it's another. And he's all together lovely. And all the palm branches, the celebration, the fulfillment, and somehow. And you, you know, I'm joking, but somehow even the disciples, they were like, man, aren't I great? <laughs> aren't I just so great? <laughs> just an ass. <laughs> I think I've got a great ass, though. Sorry, that, I can't say that. I can't say that. I don't know if I can say that in America. America, is that a swear word? I'm so sorry. I take that back. We're not in the South, though. We're fine, eh? In the, in the Bible vault, that wouldn't have gone down well. I'm sorry. Oh, man, I probably lost half the room already. Well, it's probably part of my tactic. I'm trying to break you out of the thought of like, it's another meeting. Oh. Yeah, I mean, those disciples, they're like, man, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest donkey of them all? Who's the great? Can I sit on your left? Can I sit on your right? You know, like, oh. And the mother of the sons of thunder is like, which one of my sons will be on the left and right? And the disciples going back and forth, who's the greatest? Who's going to be on the left? Who's going to be on the right? Which donkey is it going to be? Oh. And they call up this little child. Jesus says, bring this, bring this little child up. And this child comes in Matthew 18. And, and this little child, anyone out there, you know, you, you like to be, you know, you want to be the best. Hey? I'm even coming here, I'm like, man, there's such great speakers here. Chris is here and Eric, Katie's here. I'm like, oh, God, I hope I'm good. I hope I'm okay. Anyone been there in their workplace, in their family? I'm like, I just want to be the best donkey God. And um, 
The disciples are the same, like, I want to be the greatest. I want to be the greatest. And Jesus said, bring that child up here. Bring that child here. And he called the little child to him. He placed the child amongst them, like right in the middle. So there, there wasn't a distance, but there was this closeness. But truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. If whoever takes a lowly position of a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Never welcomes one such child, and my name welcomes me. I just slap someone next to you and say, You're a donkey. (laughs) (laughs) Why don't you just tap someone next to you and say, You've got a great donkey. You know, and then just slap yourself too and say, I've got a great donkey. (laughs) And then tap the person next to you and just say, man, you're a childish, you're you're a man, you're like, you're just such a child. Just slap, slap them and say, you're such a child. A friend of mine, he's a prophet, and his name's Julian Adams, amazing man. And he went into this realm in the spirit, and he saw himself dancing in the heavens and dancing next to the river of um, life, and, and he was r- dancing and dancing, and Julian, he's this, um, how can I describe him? He's got a, a bit of a pot belly, and he's like a quirky guy, and... He's a prophet, amazing guy. He prophesied the date Upper Room would go live. They were an underground movement, and that it would become public, and, and just like craziest like prophet. And uh, everything happened to the T. Um, first time, I think he was 23, prophesied that there would be a flood in England, and a certain city would hit newspapers. There would be this move, of, and it all happened. And Anyway, he's a crazy guy. So he's this, this like big-bellied like guy, and he's hopping about in this dream. And he gets into heaven, he's in heaven next to the, and he gets to this big door in the heavens, and he's like hopping around, and he gets to it, and the door is massive, but the door is, the only way to get in is this little door here. The door can't open, it's like bolted closed, but there's this little door like this, and in the dream, he suddenly becomes really small, like a little child. And he enters right into the heavens. And I thought to myself, I got to get a little bit smaller. And you know what I mean by that. I don't mean I need to hold back a little bit more. I I just, uh, I need to become a little bit more childlike. And... um, when I was in, a, uh, in Reading, California, I'm a pastor in Reading. Uh, I lead a, a technology school called Bethel Tech. I've got a background in electronic engineering and similar to my friend Marshall and, and my friends here. And, and, uh, and then I went into ministry post that and launched this thing called Bethel Tech, helped launch it that we take kingdom-minded believers and we launch them into the workspace. Quite crazy. It's unbelievable. And... I'm in this meeting where I'm leading, and I don't know if anyone in the room was here. It was a, a, it was a revival group called Jamila Page's Revival Group. Yeah, a couple of you. A couple of you were there. And I, so kind of imagine the setting. It's COVID times. We're outside in a stairwell, but there's about 100 people packed in the stairwell. My friend over here is leading worship. He's in the room. And the Spirit of God gets so heavy and weighty. And it just gets thick, like this place has been thick. And when there's a corporate connection, touch someone next to you and say, we're connected. (laughs) When there's a corporate connection, the greater the connection, the greater the anointing. And pop, 
like just if if you uh, if if you uh, um, if you focus on a unity and a connection, suddenly you can go places in the yeah. spirit realm. It's the unity is the it's the um, oil of the new covenant in Psalm one three three. It's it says that unity is like oil running off of Aaron's beard. Aaron was the high priest, and because he was anointed with that oil, he was able to go through the outer court, through the inner court, into the holy place and the holy of holy places. If he wasn't anointed, he couldn't do that. And it says that unity is like oil running off Aaron's beard. Unity allows us to go in the spirit layers and depths that we could not go, just like the high priest. So tap someone next to you and say, we're connected and we're going in. <laughs> oh, your break. Turn to someone close to you and say, your breakthrough is my breakthrough. We're going in. Shout across at someone and say, I want you to be encountered because then we're all going in. Oh, come on. Come on. That's why. Oh, there we go. Keep going. <laughs> oh, I feel it. Yeah. Man, I'm telling you, you'll go way further connected than you'd ever dream of. I'm telling you, Jesus, it was Jesus, the Father, the Son. They were in a place of connection. They came out of connection, sent Jesus for a connection, to restore a connection, so we had a connection for the rest of our days. If you're trying to do this thing by yourself, you're wasting your time. Jesus' whole ministry was, I'm not coming to set a world free. I'm not coming to preach a message. I'm coming to connect. I'm coming for relationship. And if you've, you've built your life and I've got to just build this, I've got to build that, I've got to build this, I've got to set these people free, I've got to do that, I've got to da, 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 da. And you've left out connection, you've left out relationship, I'm telling you, you're not working with the gospel. Everyone's like, Jesus came to set people free. He came for a relationship. And out of that, freedom comes. But sometimes if anyone's in ministry here or in a ministry school, give me a wave. Sometimes... People are like, you know what? I want to I wanna do the stuff. And they miss out all in the relationship. And I'm like telling you, you're not doing the gospel. <laughs> you got to fall in love. Where was I? I was talking about something. JD, where was I? I was talking about something. Then I got to. Bethel Tech. I was in a meeting, Jetty's leading it. We're so connected, like we are today. Oh, I like a connected room. Oh, even if you don't even know the people, just look around and just be like, ooh, that person over there across the room, they're getting touched by God. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Your breakthrough's my breakthrough, my breakthrough's your breakthrough. If you're going up, I'm going up with you, come on. Come on, I know this. I know how it works. I know how this realm works. Jesus didn't do it by himself. He says, you 12, come with me. I could do it by myself, but I'm all about the relationship. Oh, I'm going up. Oh, that's why I like Ben and Hannah, because they're my friends. That's what we do. We cry together. We weep together. Oh, look, I like you. What's your name? You're great. Stand up quickly. Yeah, you. you what's your name? Didi. Fire on her, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're great. Look at joy. You are so full of joy. Now, are you guys connected? Are you guys married? Oh, why don't you both stand up? Why don't you both stand up? Wow. Oh, let me tell you, their breakthroughs, your breakthrough, your breakthroughs, their breakthrough. Fire right now, God. Fire on them, God. Oh. I see the Lord using you in ministry and business. There's a unique gifting on your, on your minds with, to, to steward intelligence and to steward business, but there's a unique gifting to bring into the local church. And God says, you're gonna be used in the local church. You're gonna be used in the local church. You're gonna be used in the local church. And I see the fifth year being a year of transformation and you're on a journey and this is the fifth year of that journey. And God says, oh, it's time is now. Time is now. Time is now. Oh, I like you guys. Look at you. You're great, <laughs> hey. Well, well, we've started then, eh? Well, here you go. Woo! 
Yeah, yeah, you just got to be yourself. And let me tell you, I, I just don't fit that mold all the time. I just, <laughs> so I'm in this meeting, they're so connected, and we go up. Man, we go up. That meeting went for about six, seven hours. Just the power of God. You know that realm that opens up where it's a minute is a year, and a year is a minute, and it's like timeless, and you come up, and you're out of time, and it's like, Jesus. Oh, I love him. Ah, I love it. It's like when I spend time with my wife. Have you, you ever been like that? Anyone ever dated and it's like your goodbye goes until like, you're saying goodbye. And when you, it's like that goodbye goes till one in the morning. It's, but you started at 10 o'clock saying goodbye. Anyone, anyone been there? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Man, it's like a moment is like, a, is like four hours and four hours is like a moment when you're in love. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I love it. Eh? Oh, I love my wife. 11 year married, love it. And I go up in the spirit because of the level of connectedness. I go high above Reading, and I see in the spirit realm above Reading, and I start to see, because I'm an intercessor at heart, and I start to see above the city, because often God will take you up to a place where you have authority, and I go up above the city, and I start to see this, the spirit of comparison over uh, the city, and I start to see this political spirit or this religious spirit that's bringing a comparison over. I'm like, what is this? And then, I, and then the worship gets thicker and wild, and I pop up even higher, and I go up above the nation, and I start to see over the nation this comparison spirit and this political spirit of who's the greatest, who's the best. And, and then I start to look over the globe, and I'm like, oh, wow, there's this comparison a spirit that's over this place. And I'm like, whoa. And I I know how, I know as an intercessor what not to do. You don't take on principalities head on unless the Lord leads you to. And so I'm like, okay, that's so fascinating. I come back down and I'm like, okay, wow. And just in Christ, and I'm like, wow, I wonder what I'm supposed to do. And the Lord leads me to the scripture. And he starts showing me where there was comparison with the disciples. I want to be the greatest. I want to be the greatest. And Jesus says, bring that child here. And I think, oh, man, I'm going to warfare this thing. I'm going to break this thing. And God said, locked up in the children is a key that would dislodge this comparison spirit. And in so much transition, let's just be honest. I'm just going to be really honest with you guys. Bethel Church just went through a big transition. We had Eric Johnson, our lead pastor, shift on. And, and then there was this jostle. I'm just being honest. It felt like this thing of like, oh, wow, like, Who's important? Who has, a, who has a role? Who doesn't have a role? Who like, and inside of me, I'm like, oh, wow, am I, am I important? Am I valuable? And this comparison thing comes up, and uh, anyone been in transition recently? <laughs> it's like, am I valuable? Anyone out there? And you start comparing with, and I can not normally do that. And then there's this political climate that seems to hit the globe where it's like, oh, this race is important, more important than that race, and there's a debate, and there's this debate, and then the political on this, and that's important. And, and there's this, it starts to filter in across, and I started being like, how do we take this down? And the Lord said to me, well, look at how Christ did it. You've got to focus on the children. Not just the children, but the inner child. Unlock the five-year-old, God. Oh, just slap your stomach and say, unlock the five-year-old. <laughs> you think I'm foolish? This is kingdom, right? Here. You need to become like that jolly prophet that becomes really small to get into the kingdom. You think like, no, man, we got to get more serious. Don't see that. I don't see that fruit in the spirit. Seriousness is not a fruit of the spirit. I see a lot of joy. I see a lot of peace, I see a lot of righteousness, I don't see a lot of seriousness. Oh man, so many people are going to get touched today. I don't just say that as a hope, I just know. Oh, I just know. Mm. Oh. Oh, I just turn to someone near you and say, oh, he wants to encounter you so much. Oh, I'm telling you, it's so much easier. So much easier. It's so like... 
It's just. And so I started searching out children. Like I'm an intercessor and a lot of people think intercession means you have to sit and pray. Like I bet you this room is full of intercessors. I mean, if you've gravitated towards these guys, you, you love to pray. And, and I believe in like acts that, that can change an atmosphere. And so I said, you know what, I'm gonna focus on the children. So there was this guy by the name of Will Hart. Anyone know who that is? Yeah. He's an amazing minister in Iris. And, and I heard his last time preaching was uh, gonna be an hour away and, uh, in Reading. And he was gonna then move the Iris office to Tennessee. So I thought to myself, I'm driving in the car. I'm driving up. It's a youth gathering. I'm probably gonna be one of the oldest people there, but I just need to receive. So I drive up, I, Jetty jumps in the car with me, and this guy jumps in the car with me. Mark Brooks, he leads our school in Reading, uh, drives in the, the car with me, and we get there, and I'm, an, I'm a little older than the rest of the guys, and, and he preaches, and he doesn't lay hands on me, he doesn't preach, but I started to watch as these children would get marked by Jesus, and I felt the pleasure of God. Oh, I felt so pleased by God, and it's going to be frank, quite often the children's ministries aren't always celebrated in the churches because the children don't play the tithe, you know? So, but like, uh, I feel God is just, there's, he's locked up in the kids, like especially at the moment to dislodge a spirit of comparison. And I saw, so I was like, oh, jeez. Well, that was, that was a bit harsh. I'm so sorry. I take it back. If anyone is offended, I honestly, I'm not here to offend. I'm here to love. And, and, uh, and so then I, I, after that, I think I did a youth, uh, a a children's camp. So there's about 100 children there, ages 8 to... This is the last two months. I'm taking in a story, and I'm prophesying over you because I believe the Lord wants to release a spirit of comparison so you step into the inner you, and that there's going to be marking moments that people step into encounters across this place. And, uh, I've watched... I've got a team that I'm mentoring right now. I've watched them become goofier and goofier, but... Uh, what I've seen inside of them is I've seen them be unlocked. There's something happening right now in these people I'm mentoring. They are being unlocked, and they are funnier and funnier. They're very funny. Um, and so we go, I go to this children's camp, and I remember there was this one child. It always starts with one. It's always a key that opens a door. There's always a woman at the well that sees a city saved. That's why I'm like, everyone's like, we want a corporate touch. I'm like... He came for the one, and then the whole room will be touched. If you get your breakthrough, they'll get their breakthrough. If I get my breakthrough, you'll get your breakthrough. I'm like, God, touch me, God. Oh, if someone in this room gets touched by God, I'm telling you, we're going in. <laughs> oh, turn to someone near you. I want you to get your breakthrough because I'm going in. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. You'll go further if you help. You'll go, you'll go up your mountain if you help five people get up their mountain. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. The best leaders add value to others. They're, they're, no one goes anywhere selfish. Oh, man, I want, the, I want people all around me to get so wrecked by Jesus today. Oh, I want everyone next to me to get so touched by Jesus. Oh, because then I'm going in. And go up and... And uh, uh, this one child, her name's Hannah Wilson, gets whacked by the power of God. A friend of mine, Ben Wilson's daughter, gets so radically, she's 10 years old, rad, screaming, power of God, wrecking her. I'm like, what is this? 10-year-olds shaking, screaming. The, like, they don't make this stuff up. Oh, Jesus, I want that, God. I don't want the screaming, but I, oh, I don't mind it. I don't mind the screaming, but I just want the touch, God. Whatever it looks like, I, I, I know you want that. You're hungry. You are so hungry. You wouldn't be here on a, on a Saturday if this wasn't true. You're so hungry. Oh, Jesus. And, and then I started like a whirlwind started happening around them. And just these children, these 10-year-olds, da, boom, 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 boom. And it's like, it looked like, have you seen that uh, Ronald Bonke video? It looked like Jesus walking through the crowd. And it was just like this crowd of kids just da, 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 da. Never seen it. I was like, wow. But you know what I knew? God, you're dislodging a spirit of comparison. 
over Bethel, over Reading, over this region, oh God, over people, because the children are getting a focus. Unlock the inner child in you right now. Ooh, come on, God. And then we go, and I think I spoke at a youth group a week later because I'm following this thread. Not for significance, because I, I know as an intercessor what's happening. To dislodge this. And, oh, you're going to feel so free. And we go to this youth group, and to be honest, the first, I did two meetings in a row. The first one, I think I performed a little bit. Just a little, not like black and white, like, but just a little bit. I think I was trying to be great. Anyone been there? You try, like, do you? Like, yeah, I just want to be the best. I just want to be that donkey. I'm going to be great. I'll tell my best stories. I'm going to be the, I'll just be my best. And it just wasn't great. It was good. It was really good. I mean, I got phone calls, and it was great. Phone calls, children, um, first time account. It was amazing. But I remember feeling like, oh, God, I was, I, was the, I was a little bit too much of the donkey. I gave too much attention to the donkey instead of the one riding it. Oh, God, ride me, God. <laughs> just get on me. Uh, like, <laughs> just, like, get on my shoulders, God. And, man... And the second meeting, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to be, I'm going to be me. Let me tell you, people are going to trust you if you the most you. Like, people connect with people that are actually comfortable in their own skin. Like, I'm, like I'm, I'm done with trying to be Bill. I can't do it. I just can't. Like, I'm done with trying to be Chris Valentin, who, like, I just can't do it. I, I just can't do Billy Graham. And, and like, I'm just, I'm me. Turn to someone next to you and say, you're great as you. Yeah. Yeah. And when I'm like all like me and stuff, I find people actually listen. But when I'm trying to be like someone else, it's like they just don't, they just don't connect. Huh. And so I've just, I'm like, here we go. And the power of God hits these youth so wildly. Boom. Like just, Wow. And kids just get wrecked and full of the Holy Spirit all across first timers. And I love it because there's bunches of them are just on their phones, you know, because they're not, you, they may not be like you, like the hungriest. They're just there. Maybe their, their parents drop them off and they're on their phones, not because they're bad people, but they're numbing pain. Just flicking. Anyone numb pain by flicking? Here you go. And just numbing pain. And I remember calling out that one that was just flicking on the front row just the whole time I was speaking. I wasn't irritated. I just knew what was happening. Just there's just pain, trauma locked up in there, and they're just numbing themselves. At least it's not pornography, they're flicking, it's fine. Like, it's whatever their vices, their drug of choice is, is num numbing themselves. I'm like, okay. But they get up, and I, I get a detail about their mom and dad going through a divorce, and it was a, it was a three month period, but God was going to do this, this, and this, and it was going to affect their brother. And they just break, the power of God fills them, courage fills them. They're just weeping and weeping. And these kids' lives just across the place get changed. And I felt the pleasure of Jesus. Oh, because also I knew what I was doing. I was dislodging something in the spirit of comparison that was happening over people, over the region. Oh, man, people are going to get so set free, that inner child. And then recently we went and I did a chapel. It was about two weeks ago at um, Bethel. We have this children's chapel. And the first meeting we got there, it was great. Power of God, beautiful. And then they said, the kindergarten teacher has n uh, not come. Do you think you could stay? And I've, I had so many meetings that I was like, of course, anything for a glory meeting. Of course, I have nothing on today at all. I'm totally free. And so... The kindergarten kids came, so from ages five until eight. And, uh, and I remember um, Faye, uh, who's part of my team, gets up and prophesies of the teacher, Mr. Brown. And Mr. Brown starts going wild, like, like, uh, like Marshall Wild, just like, da, da, shit, da, ba, ra, da, ga, like, just <laughs> crazy. Mr. Brown starts spinning out and like Emerald Wild, just like going and I'm like, wow, and all the kids, there's probably about 100 kids in the room, they're like, yeah, Mr. Brown. And, and then Trish gets up, and she starts, and these kids are just, and I'm wrecked at the back, and, and I look at the time, and we've got five minutes left. And so I, I'm like, I should probably say something. So I jump up, and I 
get the mark, and I didn't even know what I was saying in the beginning. And, and then out of me comes, if you're hungry, stand up. And all these kids just were like, <laughs> all they just all jumped up, and I was like, oh. And then out of my mouth says, rush the front now. So and then all these five-year-olds and six-year-olds, literally they all came up to about here. They all start running to the front. <laughs> Like a, and the space was similar to about this. And so you got about a hundred of them all packed up around here, screaming, weeping, deliverances, sobbing, first time encounters, just like. And I sat there and I felt the pleasure of God. And God said to me, Rich, a spirit of comparison is getting broken over this region, broken over this place. Oh, I'm unlocking the inner child. I'm unlocking child likeness. Oh, it's getting broken over. I'm entering a people into the heavens. And story after story, people started phoning me and texting me. They had about 40 minutes of this craziness started happening. And they were dragging children out of the building afterwards because we have to use the room. And I got videos of a, of a six-year-old carrying a five-year-old out <laughs> as they're like just... I never knew God could do stuff like that. You know, I heard stories about it. But, and there's one seven-year-old that got so wrecked. He wept for, for three, four hours in a row. Uh, he uh, texted his mom, and she told me this last week. She said, uh, Arthur, her name's Silva, Arthur said to me, she's a pastor on staff with us. Arthur said to me this. He said, I wept, and he couldn't stop talking about Jesus. And we were driving to school the next day. And he said, Mom... I've decided I no longer want to be a ninja. <sighs> I want to be a God helper. But not in Bethel Church. I want to be out. And then he says to his mom, are there people that believe in Jesus and then stopped believing in Jesus? And she's like, yeah, those are the people I want. Oh, man. Turn to someone next to you and say, I don't want to be a ninja no more. <laughs> oh, yeah, but let me tell you, you may not want to be a ninja, but some of you are trying to be way too serious. Turn to someone next to you and say, I, know, I don't want to be serious no more. Oh, man. I don't want to be a ninja no more. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're doing great. You're not a ninja. You're not a ninja. You're not. You're definitely not. I mean, definitely, definitely not a ninja. You're not a ninja either, Gina. You're not a ninja. No. And the Lord spoke to me in that moment. He said, Rich, I'm restoring apostolic where there's been a lockdown of people, but I'm restoring the apostolic. I'm a send out. And people are gonna get out of just the meeting and they're gonna go out and gonna bring a message out and bring a message out and bring a message out. And, and I feel a focus on the local church, but I feel that God is awakening a people to say, I was born to go. I was born to go. I was born to go. What does it look like for me to go? I'm not talking about street evangelism. I'm just saying, just get up and go. Just get up and go. Even the, it's prophetic that Marshall's here. He was a leader in our healing rooms at Bethel for so long. And there's this thing of like a job opportunity opened up for him at Google that allowed him to go. And But he's bringing the gospel at a high level at a place. Let me tell you, that's kingdom. I think it's prophetic. It's prophetic. There's a go. And if you focus on, I feel like if there's going to be a focus on just like, where's my moment? Where's my... What a, a comparing, where's my, where's my, where's my, we're going to get into this internal fight in local church and ministries. Instead, it's like, you know what? We're called to go, go out. We're called to actually bring the kingdom of God outside. We're called to bring the kingdom of God outside and see Jesus touch. We're called to adventures, children. We're called to not to be locked inside. If you're locked inside, I see an antsy child going, oh, mom, 
and tantrums starting to happen. You call to go outside and play. You, I've got a two-year-old. If I keep that two-year-old inside too long, let me tell you, I'm having a tough day. I'm having a tough day. And the church, there's been this apostolic call to go and the church has been said, stay inside. And I'm like, you know what? I'm getting a little bit tantrum -y. I'm saying, who's the best too much? I'm saying, oh, you're better. I'm, I wanna be the, I wanna, I, I need to get outside and go on an adventure. I need to play. I need to play. I need to go and play. I love that this is done not like, this is kind of feels like one of those adventures. I bet you some of you guys came in for a bit of an adventure. Some of you drove in for this. Some of you are like, I, I need an adventure. I need to get out. Oh man, you children have been locked up way too long inside. Man, and it hasn't even been raining. It hasn't been, even been raining outside and you've been locked up inside. It's time for an adventure. Time to do something you've never done before so you can see something you've never seen before happen. I, I feel like, you know, the children, they are so courageous. They jump off things and uh, look at her. Look at that. They jump off things. They try things. It's crazy. I'm like, my son, he's just got grazes all over him. He's got bruises and and just the more serious I become, the more risk assessment I become. Oh, man, and I just stay inside. I'm like, I just, I feel the Lord saying, let's go on an adventure. It's time. Hey, let's go. Let's go, man. Oh, it's true. Let's go. Oh. Why don't I have my team just come up by me? I don't know what's gonna happen right now, but it's gonna get, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna have an adventure, you know? If I get my breakthrough, you get your breakthrough. If you get your breakthrough, I get my breakthrough. Tap someone next to you, you're gonna get a breakthrough. I want you to get a breakthrough because then I'm gonna get a breakthrough. I want it. I want you to be touched by Jesus because then we all get touched by Jesus. That's what unity's like. Come on, hey. Man, there's been so much disconnection and it's made the church impotent. Like there's been so much disconnection and comparison of like, Ben, I'd, like you talking in poetry, I can't be a poet, oh, and then you distance yourself instead of connect yourself. You're an intercessor, I'm a healing person, I don't, I, but you distance yourself instead of connect yourself. You're a business guy, I'm a minister, or you distance yourself instead of connect yourself. Man, if there's any flaggers in the room, I don't know why, I just saw a bunch of fabric. I don't know if there's any fabric in the house, but get some fabric out here and just like wave it about. <sighs> yeah. Mm. There you go. You're excused. That's, sometimes that's what success looks like. You know, that's sometimes what success looks like, right there, hey? Wow! Oh, man. Oh! Shh. Think of yourself now, think of yourself as a five-year-old. Man, just think of that. Oh, God, I'm gonna, God, unlock that now, God. Oh, release them of all that seriousness. Man. There you go. I'm like... Hey, yo, do you want to? I'll tell you what's about to happen. I'm going to minister to a few individuals, but it's the woman at the well that sees a city saved. Oh, yes, bring me that. More, whatever you're doing there. Oh, it's the woman at the well that sees a city saved. And so you're like, well, I'm waiting for my word. And where's my word? I need a word. I mean, it's only, it just needs to be one woman and a whole city gets touched. You didn't come for me, you came for, you didn't come for a word, you came for the word made flesh. And so I'm like, you know what? All I'm looking is for a small key that'll open up a big door. 
Isn't that beautiful? So then it allows you to, when someone gets touched by God, you're like, yes, their breakthrough is my breakthrough. If you celebrate your breakthrough, I'm celebrating my breakthrough. If you go in, I'm going in. Yay! Come on! I don't need 50 keys to open one door. A small key opens the big whoosh, and then it's all in. Then we're all in, and then it's like, wow! Healing, breakthrough. There you go. Oh, you got to become like a handkerchief. You got to become like a handkerchief. You guys are way too stiff. I tell you, if you're too stiff, the river can't take you. You got to get loose like a handkerchief to allow God to use you. And like, no, I'm just so rigid. Have you ever met those people? They're just so rigid that God can't mold them. You got too much starch in you. It's got to get loose like a handkerchief, like Hannah. Just let that river go down, down. Hey. So there's a gonna there's gonna be a few people that I just get absolutely rocked by God right now. And what it'll do, I'm just telling you exactly what happened. What it'll do will be like a, a, a key that'll open a door that boom, and then. What will happen, a realm will open up that God, you'll be able to pull like the, the Christ in the room. And so I just want to set you up. You need to celebrate as much as you can when somebody gets touched by the Holy Spirit. the black and white um, top. Do you want to, st- yes, you. Do you want to stand? What? Woo! Wow. What's your name? Linda. Oh, Linda. Wow, thank you, God. Yeah, Linda, I just, um, I saw the Lord, um, almost like standing behind you with his hands on your shoulders. Wow. And I just, I see God just bringing you the deepest comfort and um, to your spirit. Wow. And I see him like lifting off this heaviness that's been on you. Wow. Yeah. We just, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Wow. 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 Yeah. And I just, um, I just see you um, actually Wow. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Whoosh. Whoa. Yeah, I just see God coming on your children. And I see God touching. Um, do you have a son? I have a, a son dog. A son dog. Wow. Do you know this happens a lot with the dogs? <laughs> <For me. laughs> wow. So, yeah, so I just... Um, I see the Lord just coming on you in a, in a new way. I see the Lord coming in your family in a new, fresh way and the fire of God touching your family. Wow! And just a deliverance coming on your family and I see God lifting this heaviness off you. It's lifting off an oil of gladness just pouring over you. Thank you, God, for the oil of gladness. Hey, thank you, God. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I see God just touching your dog. 
The Lord is touching your dog. He's on your dog. Wow. Wow. And I actually see him, um, actually like his eyes open in in the spirit. I feel like he sees things in the spirit. Like he sees like the angelic. He sees the demon. He actually is a seer dog. And wow. And <laughs> just see that happening and I see God speaking to you through him. Wow. So yeah, so we just bless you, Linda. Wow, you're a woman of the spirit. Whoosh! You're a woman of the spirit and we just whoosh. Woo! One more. Wow. Um, the guy at the back with the hat. Uh, do you want to come forward? Yes, you. <laughs> What's her name? Orson. Um, Orson, I just saw um, just this fire in you. Wow. Um, there's this deep fire in, in your DNA. And um, I just see God um, actually raising you up as like a teacher, as a revivalist. Wow. And I see you as a man of the word. And I just see God giving you downloads in the night. Wow. Um, about the word of God, like deep encounters in the word. Um, but he's going to take you into realm, heavenly realms through the word of God. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, thanks, God. Whoa. Hey. Fire on him, God. Fire on him, God. The fire of God. Oh. Oh. It's a turning season seven years ago. You, seven years ago, you made a decision. Seven years ago, you made a decision. And this year, it's come to pass. I declare 2022 is ascending out here. Where you were before, God says, oh, I'm going to send you. Where you were before, God says, I'm going to send you. Where you were before, God says, I'm going to send you. And I see two homes opening up to you. I see a location here. And I see a location in another space. And God says, oh, two homes are opened up to you. And there'll be a going back and forth. A going back and forth and a going back and forth and there'll be an increase of authority that'll happen. And I see a job opportunity opening up and a promotion happening that'll facilitate the two. So God, we just speak in Jesus' name, a tying to this land and a tying to another in Jesus' name. A tying to this land and a tying to another in Jesus' name. You wanna? Sir, what's your name? Chuck. Oh, it's lovely to meet you, Chuck. Would you mind standing for me? Oh, thank you, Jesus, for Chuck. Oh, isn't he amazing? Yes, God, thank you, Jesus, for Chuck. I just felt the Lord say so strongly that he just isn't done, Chuck. That he isn't done, he isn't done, and that you are so worthy, that you are so worthy, and that he isn't done, and that he isn't done, and that he isn't done. And I just want to pray for you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for Chuck, God. Thank you, Jesus, for Chuck. We just pray mighty encounters in his life. Jesus, we thank you for those he leads, God. We thank you that he leads in love, God. Come, Father. Thank you that he leads in love, God. Come, come. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we just pray mighty encounters for each other. Mighty encounters for each other. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> So what's your name? <laughs> David, can you say I'm sure? Thank you, Jesus, for David. Sure, that's okay. David, I just Whoa. saw a mighty creative gift on your life. Um, I kind of saw like superheroes and stuff like that. I don't know if you're into comics or anything like that, like like writing them or stories. Like I just see that you're such a storyteller. Um, and that there's just something so fun about you. So Jesus, we just thank you for David. We thank you that he's making a way, God. Wow, I see you're making a way for people. Wow, we thank you that he's a pioneer. Wow. Yes, sure. Thank you, Jesus. Watch out. Here we go. Woo! You show me how to use this. How do you use this? Just put it on somebody. Yeah? What's your name, ma'am? Kim? Oh. All right. Jesus, touch Kim. Yeah. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. God, we thank you for Kim. Wow. Thank you for Kim. Jetty. 
in the back with the gray sweater. Young woman in the back with the gray sweater. You're wearing blue jeans. Yeah, it's you. It's just, you just stand for me. Wow. I just see freedom all over your life. Wow. I just see fire, the fire of God on your life. Wow, could someone lay hands on her? Wow. I see, I see, wow, where the Lord has said that there has been mourning, there is joy, that you are reaping joy in this season. Wow. Holy Spirit, I just pray right now, wow, for the freedom of your presence, wow, your liberation, whoosh, wow, we thank you, Holy Spirit. I just see a bunch of, like, uh, sunshine around you right now, and so where there's been heaviness, where there's been oppression in the spirit, wow, God is breaking that right now in Jesus' name. We say fullness of joy, we say fullness of joy, fullness of joy, fullness of joy in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Wow, I see, whoosh. Whoosh. Oh. Wow, thank you, Holy Spirit. Wow, thank you, Holy Spirit. Wow, we thank you, Holy Spirit. It's a season of rainbows. It's a season of rainbows. A season of rainbows. Goodness and goodness and goodness. Wow, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Wow, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Wow, 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 wow. wow. Uh, there's a young man right here with the, the gray shirt. Yo. With the, you have a man bun in your head. Oh, Hunter. <laughs> wow. Bless Hunter, you, man. Touch wow. Your God. I heard the Lord say that you are anointed <laughs> for media and for business. Wow. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Whoosh, it's a new season, a new season, a new season. Wow, thank you for the anointing that rests on this man's life. Wow, thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for favor and grace and business. We thank you for open doors and the Spirit. Wow, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Wow, 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 wow. Shia-ra-ba-ba-ba, whoosh. Actually, if you're wearing gray, can you stand for me, please? If you have, like, a gray sweater or a gray shirt on, where are you? Can you just stand? Wow. Gray, wow. gray, Wow, if you're wearing gray, gray, gray just stand. Oh. Wow. It's Thank you, Holy good. Spirit. <laughs> Go ahead and just open up your palms. Wow. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Whoosh. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Wow, it's a season of joy. A season of joy. A season of joy. I see, wow, thank you, God. It's a season of joy. Wow, thank you, God, for sunshine and rainbows. Sunshine and rainbows in the spirit. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Wow, where there's been heaviness and oppression, God is bringing freedom and liberation. Freedom and liberation. Wow, thank you, God. Thank you, God. I feel like the Lord is inviting some of us to play with dolls again. Just playing with our dolls and just becoming childlike in his presence, coming childlike in his feet. Wow, thank you, God. Thank oh. you, God. Oh. Yes, yes. This lady over here, Lorenzo, go to her quickly. God's on you. This lady right here, this lady here. Yes, you. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's Audrey. I didn't even know. Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord God. Oh, I see, the G I see Jesus just over you saying, this is my most precious of daughter. My most precious of daughter. Oh, Holy Spirit, go deep. I see three generations deep. God, I speak over a DNA. I speak life, 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 life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, my whole team. If you, oh, Abby, come here quickly. Put your hands on it. Oh. Holy Spirit, I just thank you for a fresh life. I declare in Jesus' name an encounter with the Christ's eyes. In Jesus' name. There's a man over here. What's your, your name? So why don't you just stand up? What's your name? Craig. Rick. Rick, I saw uh, over you, I saw there'd been an accusation over you 
and it led you to a place of like, I don't know if I can continue doing this. And I felt the Lord say that there's gonna be grace over your life to walk through this troubled waters. And I saw a bridge coming over the troubled waters. And I saw the Lord saying, I'm gonna be the bridge that allows you to walk over this troubled waters. And I saw a massive leadership mantle that rested on you, Rick. I saw this leadership gift that rests on you. And I saw many around you, surrounding you, employees. And I saw God saying, oh, I've given you grace to lead. I've given you grace to lead. And there's been this question in your mind, am I, am I, am I? And God says, watch, I'm gonna give you a bridge to step over this troubled waters. And I see it getting washed away during this season. I felt the last six months have been six months that have stolen in some ways. And God says, watch, there's gonna be a restoration time for you. And so God, I just thank you for fresh favor, fresh favor. And I, I see a connection with the people group um, like a multicultural people group. And I saw the Lord saying, I'm gonna open up doors with another people group and open up doors with another people group. And I saw a, like God extending your tent pegs, expanding your, your tent and expanding things where things feel like they're reducing. God says, I'm expanding. So God, I like this man. And something's gonna happen with your wife in this next season that's gonna make her come alive. Like uh, she's... God's, she's like, there's gonna be fresh reasons for her to get out of bed in the morning. And God says, oh, there's a coming alive season, a coming alive season, a coming alive season. And, and there's, a, there's a lady over here with the, the dark hair, black shirt. Yes, you come up quickly, come up quickly. Oh, and if I could get somebody like just to catch up something. Yeah, what's your name again? Oh, what's your name? I know you. Kelsey, oh God, Kelsey is doing something so, uh, God, Kelsey's, God is doing something so special with you in this season. And I saw him writing this love story with you. And I saw this love story getting right, written with you that's healing a story of the past. And I saw this, uh, this story getting written and it was written with a golden thread. And God's saying, I'm rewriting a story that caused pain. I'm rewriting it in this season and it's gonna cause healing. And I saw it all around the area of love. And God's saying, this is the time of restoration for you. And, there's been a hiding in the closet and God says, oh, there's a coming out to be seen and where being seen was so painful. God says, oh, it's gonna be beautiful that you're in the, you're in the seen place. And I see where you felt like hidden, like a blanket over you. God's saying, blanket off time. And it's gonna be unbelievable the amount of people that see you. And it's gonna feel awkward, but God says it's healing. God says it's healing, God says it's healing, God says it's healing. And so God, I thank you for this next season of Akulsi's life. I see uh, something that your mother walked through that you're like, I don't want that to be me. And I see God saying, oh, I'm gonna walk you through that and it's not gonna be you. So God, the same thing that you apportioned uh, for your mom, but, uh, for her mom, but then it got robbed. I thank you, Lord God, that you apportioned it for her, but double fold. And so I just prophesy, Father, a, a turning of time for her. And I declare, you're writing a love story, you're writing a love story, you're writing a love story. And I, and I saw something in your mother's line. I saw God shoot through your belly button. And I saw God say that, oh, uh, that which was sown in from your mom. And I was like doubt and disbelief. And the Lord says, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sow something into your heart and your mind that's gonna cause you to be the most childlike, faithful, not fearing woman. And so Lord God, I just thank you for what you're doing in this amazing woman's heart, amazing woman's mind. I declare in Jesus' name, grace over her mind, grace over her heart. She's a queen, she's a queen, she's a queen, she's a queen. And uh, you can just stay and pray for her if you can. And then this lady over here, why don't you come up with the, yeah, you right here with the Adidas shirt. Yeah, why don't you come quickly? What's your name again? What's your name? Delora. Just raise both your hands. Holy Spirit, I just pray that your love would fill her. Holy Spirit, I thank you that she's called. She's called to be a gateway for her family. And I see your family saying to you, you're crazy, you're crazy. And God says, no, you're not. You're wild for me. You're wild for me. You're wild for me. You're wild for me. And I still do wild things and I do it through you. I still do wild things and I do it through you. And I see you like a matriarch in your family. I see you a spiritual leader. And I see you creating a doorway for your family to walk in. So I prophesy those three that you've been praying for, those three that you've been praying for, those three that you've been praying for, those three that you've been praying for. I declare this is breakthrough time for those three. Breakthrough time for those three, especially the second born, I declare in Jesus' name. Breakthrough time for the second born. 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 Oh, oh, King of glory. 
Have your glory in this family, O King of glory. Have your glory in this family. I declare of this matriarch, God, I just see the Lord honoring you in heaven. I see a celebration in the heavens. And I see, the, I see this angel coming to your house. And I see this angel coming to your house and touching a second born. I, for some reason, I see it by this food truck. And I see the Lord touching the second born by this food truck. And I see God marking him, marking him, marking him. And he says, oh, good and faithful mother, good and faithful mother, good and faithful mother. And your energy level is gonna increase in the season. I see a sevenfold increase. The energy levels just increase, 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 increase. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Marshall, you should just come in and just do your thing, Marshall, as you do, as Marshall does over there, as you do. There you go, Marshall, do your thing. Well, there you go. And this lady with blue hair, if someone with blue hair is great. Yeah, you're the only person with blue hair. Yes, come. <laughs> just open your hands, open your hands. Holy Spirit, I just thank you. She said it's about time. I just declare, Lord God, there's been an attack. There's been a season on her life where it's just like, man, thing after 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 thing has been happening. And I just declare in the realm of the Spirit, like a child of authority, that stops now, Jesus. You've come here and you've come for, you know what, deliverance is God's kindness. And you've come to be set free. The Lord says, oh, it's freedom time. It's freedom time. It's freedom time. Oh, and then where you've been mis misunderstood and misused in the past, the Lord says, I'm bringing you to a safe community that's gonna understand you, a safe community that's gonna understand you. I see him grafting you into a community, grafting you, and I see before where you struggle to commit to a community, the God says, I'm gonna give you courage to commit. I'm gonna give you courage to commit. And in that community, I see a healing that you never thought was possible. And I saw the Lord saying, oh, there's courage to commit, there's courage to commit, there's courage to commit. And I I saw you picking up authority where authority was laid down in an unhealthy way by your father. The Lord says, oh, authority is gonna be picked up by you in a healthy way. And so Holy Spirit, I just thank you. Turning, turning, a turning of the clock, 12 to one, a turning of the clock, a turning of the clock for a fresh season, a turning of the clock for a fresh season. Marshall, come and come do your thing, Marshall. Come and come and Marshall, do your thing, Marshall. Come and Marshall, give him a bucket. This lady at the back with the arm, yeah, yeah, come quickly. Now I know you. Where do I know you from? Have we met before? Oh, why don't you just keep God's riding with your marriage, and I, I saw God writing the story, which is called pain, and that was just called, um, I saw God saying, oh, I'm writing a story I saw this being written in the, in, in the book. And, and so God, story of love. You're writing the story of love with her. You're writing the story of love with her. You're writing the story. And God says that you've got this ability to create, this ability to create money, but it's to create you coming out of yourself. And I saw this writing coming out of you and this creativity coming out of you. And so Holy Spirit, I just thank you that this is a season of unlocking. I see faith inside of you and hunger inside of you that is so unique and so special. So Lord God, I just release what's on my wife's life. I declare would rest on her life. Just as it's our 11th year of marriage, I declare it's a season of transition for her, even in relationship. And I declare in Jesus' name, would you just send a ripple through her timeline and, and through her family line that's caused pain, Lord God, in the area of relationship. I declare it's a restoration, redemption story that you're writing, God. Oh, and you're so significant. You're so powerful. Abby, come and do what Abby does. And G as a Gina, why don't you come up? I remember. <laughs> okay, great. Um, <laughs> I don't know how this is gonna work. Okay, Gina, I remember prophesying over you at hunger school years ago. If there's anyone else in the room from the hunger school, just give me a wave. Oh, I love that school. Love that school. Holy Spirit, I just thank you for a woman that's called to bring kingdom. And so, Holy Spirit, I just thank you. I saw your business, which you spoke to me about, like a fashion type business. And I saw your business and I saw um, the church and I saw this like, uh, like this link, like between the two, like almost like a Twizzler, like a link, like between the two. And I saw God saying uh, that 
it's good that you, the church and your business are linked in some way. And I saw you bringing in people from the local church almost as consultants or, or uh, um, consultants or like employees from your local church. And I saw because of that, there's gonna be an extension that happens and a building that happens. And the Lord says, oh, I'm really proud of you before the risk that you've taken in the last two years. I'm really proud of you for the risk that you've taken. And I see grace falling out over it. So Holy Spirit, I thank you, God, that you pour out your love just over her in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Can I do one more thing? Yeah. Okay, and then if you're hungry, <clears throat> I'd love if you just stood up. And then why don't you just rush the front? <laughs> and then can you sing something, Jackie? Jackie, just sing something over us. Sing something over us. Fresh fire, fresh fire, you Oh, fresh fire, God, fresh fire, fresh fire.
Check. I heard the Lord say, it is finished, and now I'm refining. Even though it's finished, it doesn't mean that I'm not still refining you. Woo. Yield to the fires of refinement to the soul. Holy one, by that finger that stirs the holy bowls. Walking through to and fro through your seven lampstands, meeting and weaving your church together as one. Commingle these flames and these fires across all seven until we see the utter fulfillment in the one new man. This is the refining fire of the one new man so that we too would be lost in the fire with him that we were there with Christ Jesus as one. <laughs> as he walked in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That furnace that Nebuchadnezzar threw them into, that was unto Molech, an idol and a god, it can't devour us any longer. But instead we proceed from the mouth of that false king, and we see the fires consume the ones that serve it. And they fall down unto the God that we serve of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No more will children be given to the fire. We are rescuing them. We're lifting them out of the bowels of Molech. And oh, uh, because we've come into this refining season, we don't have the fear of going into that furnace any longer. In fact, we find a habitation in this, like the Laodicean church. These little children are coming out of the fire now. Non-consumed, they were never lost. They just needed one to go in with them and take them by their tiny little hands. Running, leaping, jumping for joy out of that mouth of its false consumer. Out of their tomb. Wow. Jesus. 
I'm just gonna go for it. If if there's any ladies or even men who uh, have suffered participating in an abortion or even an abortion of dreams and hopes, that child's in that fire. And because you've won hope with Christ again to be made in union, we are going in together with you as one body to rescue that one and the many. Little did we know they went and were huddling with the others and finding refuge and safety and that Christ has been with them all along. But this is a remnant <laughs> that live in it is finished and without fear. That have fasted and have the wisdom of Daniel and interceded as he did too. That picture of the fiery furnace is a picture of leaving Babylon like Israel did. That was a prophetic picture and they had to emerge out of that furnace for one day to, for them to leave out of their slavery. So little childs, little smiling faces, even what was supposed to be your death, we actually see that you found light there where Christ was and you were waiting for the church to join you. We needed you and go and lift up one and cradle him and love him, love her and Christ in them that needs to be rescued and brought back into the sheepfold. Oof. And you can see through that ease and peace, there is no judgment, there's no condemnation because they're still alive and more alive now that they found vitality through joining into and being engrafted into their parents again. Wow. So again, we're not really transitioning, but we're transitioning. Healing Rooms is gonna just stay and let you sink in this, but we are gonna actually do baptisms next. So if you wanna celebrate newness of life, <laughs> it's actually outside in the courtyard. And uh, there's a fountain in the middle. Now here's one thing, if you can help us out. Across the bridge in the back, there's a barn. There's actually a memorial service being held there. So we just wanna be uber respectful to them and not uh, really wander around much of the campus, kinda of stay more confined to the sanctuary. We're gonna spend a little time out in the middle of the quad for the baptism time. And so we also wanna kinda of keep noise somewhat to a minimum to be respectful. So that would include like shofars and your weapons of warfare. <laughs> Feel free to let it loose in here, but we're gonna just try and keep it mellow outside. And uh, yeah, so if, if you would like to participate, uh, we're gonna start a line out there. Um, just so you know, Carmen Philstein is the first one in that line. Her spot is already reserved. <laughs> so line up behind her. <laughs> And uh, if you have a change of clothes, that's ideal, or a friend that might have some, or your own towel. And uh, then from that, you can just sort of go to lunch or come back, or I kind of encourage, this is a short day, you know, feast on Jesus. <laughs> and then uh, Katie's gonna serve up some more hot bread for us at three o'clock. And we're gonna be very sharp at three because it's a short, compact period of time. So I appreciate it. And then also please don't wander across to the red buildings. Um, there are bathrooms there, but we're only gonna use that if you're uh, just been baptized where you can change in there. But those are their offices and children's rooms and church staff. So